Not in like two or three, where people are just like, my son told me to run a Chromebook, so I got him a Chromebook. <laughs> and it didn't <laughs> run. And it didn't run, so now I have to tell this parent that's obviously irate. Yeah. To just straight up just be like, listen, I'm sorry, but like, it doesn't, it can't do this. And they're just like, why not? It doesn't work like <laughs> that. And I'm like, well, um, yeah, I just, I, just we, we didn't do it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hey! And uh, my moderator and good buddy Tal is the first one through the, through the door. What out, Tal? Welcome! Uh, okay. Tal and I actually, uh, well, I say served together. Tal helped me out at a couple of events. Uh, I did one in London where I got given the budget to do this event. I had one title to show off. I had one dev. And I'm like, cool, can I get some booth? So people to come over for the booth. And the guy's like, nope. Gotta do it solo. So like two weeks later, I just DM Tal and was like, Tal, I need your help. I haven't got any staff to run this booth and we're meant to be showing off this game and there's journos and I don't know what I'm doing. Tal's like, mate, mate, calm down. <laughs> calm down, I'll be there. Yeah, no, like, during my days of enforcing, I remember like getting, getting these like massive like AAA booths and halfway through, they'll just, you know, I would just be like, hey, so I'm gonna need like at least two people to like man lines. It'll just be like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to do right now. I have like Ubisoft and they have like a monolith. Like literally mm -hmm. it takes up like, like it's just huge. And you know, I mean, they, they, they got, I mean, they have like 36,000 staff members running around inside it, and they're just like, we can't, we don't want to cap lines. <laughs> I'm just like, no! Uh, dude, you joke, you joke, but like, there was a point where if I had been, if I was a gentleman in the millions, I would have literally sent out a flare and just flown 50 enforcers to TwitchCon because there was no line management. Oh well, wait. This TwitchCon or other TwitchCons? Because Twitch this Con one just gone. Not have line management. And this one just gone did not have line management, and it was spooky. Uh, let me well, go, go like, for it. Yeah. No. Uh, no. Go. 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 No. I was What's gonna that? say hello to all the lovely people we got coming in. So we got ah. Van der Beasts, Compliment Cap, Some Numbers, uh, Aspects, Green Fire, Valis, and Alpha of the Deluge. What ho, friends! Uh, as per usual, you've got. About 10 minutes before I introduce Chris proper and we get into the, the meat of it. So if you want to go get yourself a beverage, if you want to go say uh, hi howdy to your nearest and dearest to your pets, now is the time. Also, I'm sorry I left Facebook open in the background and I'm sorry I made all of you just check your alerts. That's on me. That's on me. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, this TwitchCon, actually seeing everybody and hanging out was great, but the... It just, it's so desperately needed, like a squad of enforcers to go in and be like, we are sorting this. But that was, but that was also like when E3 went open to the public again. Oh that God. Was, that was an insanity. Uh -huh. This, this one, I just, I don't think they expected that many people to show up on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, mean, yeah, they, they fixed a bunch of things on Saturday and Sunday, but the damage is already done. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Like it was, it was kind of ass to nine. I mean, I, on Friday. I told you our little story, which was that because uh, our convention motto has become uh, "House Longship, we do not queue." So um, we decided we were just going to wait for the lines to die down and maybe get in like an hour late or something. But it's fine. And like two and a half hours later, we f saw the first person get carted out by an ambulance from heat exhaustion, and we're like, "Feck it, we're going to the pub." The p closest bar we could find was in the Hilton, one of the attached hotels. And there oh, was just- Oh yeah, the ones a, that are, yeah. yeah. There was just a place you could just walk through. And I don't mean like we pretended to be VIPs so we snuck through. It was just there. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but wait, what? Yeah, no, they, they didn't, they did not say which entrances were gonna open at what time. They didn't even say that there was other entrances. Uh, it was just a bunch of stuff, but whatever. Like they learned, it was it, it's great. You know, I I let my booth stay open like an extra hour, even though they they straight up told me like, but that that's that's like a story in itself. Oh yeah. They're like, oh well, you don't have to stay open. I'm like, no, no, no I will. Like my also, volunteers dipped. I wanna because 
I don't want to go too much on TwitchCon because these poor lovely folks have had to hear me waffle on about it. But I want to take this opportunity to <laughs> thank you for for dragging me in for the Tiny Build Mixer. Like, well, no, you you need to be there, dude. I uh, because I I'd had the 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 good fortune of meeting Scott Manley a few times before because uh, he knows Dean who I worked for back in the day. So by being kind of like ambiently around Dean, I got introduced. But feckin' Scott introduced me to a bloke from literal NASA. You know that situation when you're in a group of people and you realize that you are, by several margins, the dumbest person in the room? That was me, and it was amazing. Uh, and I don't know if, uh, if Lucas, uh, if Lucas Comap, or Lucas Comp, or however it goes is your good self, but regardless, thank you, Lucas, for the follow. <laughs> Lucas is a beast. I love Lucas. That guy's Lucas everywhere. In here? <laughs> is Lucas in this chat? Because Lucas is everywhere. Lucas is like, honestly, he's he's Latin American community manager right now, and he's like, he's my there. We is king of speedrunners. And the right Lucas there. was coming from inside the house. Yes. Uh, my right. favorite, my favorite freaking person right there. Uh, so, Lucas, best well, friend. He's he's like one of the like the major people in Tiny Build that I, I really want to meet. Well, Lucas, it's a, it's a place to make your company by proxy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you've all got a few minutes before we do proper introductions and kick off. Uh, if you're wondering what the soundtrack is behind us, this is actually the OST to Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor, which was a phenomenally fascinating game we played earlier in the year. Um, honestly, once I start listing Tiny Build games, you're gonna lose your heck. If you don't know why today is a big deal, then you're gonna do soon. You're gonna do soon. Um, but yes, you've got you've all got like four or five minutes before we kick off. So if you want to get a cup of tea or something, do it now. Yo, do it now. <laughs> um, all right. Also, uh, Chris, just uh, so people's know, because um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of tiny build games today. Where yeah. should we be pushing people? Where is best? Do you want us to throw people at Steam? Do you want us to throw them at uh, Itch or GOG or any of those? It would it would be Steam. Steam's our primary place that we release a lot of our games. We also do it on Humble. We also do it on uh, Green Man Gaming. Uh, <laughs> we, we, Green Man. we got a lot of places. Um, There's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we got we got our things on there. Like, we got our things everywhere. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, if you want a bunch of like information on stuff, I'm pretty sure our website has a bunch of information but our steam page has everything yeah and thankfully one of the good things that steam's done of late is the publisher page so we'll be linking this uh throughout the day one and all but this is yeah. the uh yeah this is the store page for um to for tiny build this entirety greenfire's asking if we're going to play diaries of spaceport manager again yeah uh 10 wins asking uh, saying i noticed that you have the surge any chance that you can stream it? Uh, actually, yes. Um, I have heard, given the amount of time it's been out for, I've heard that at very least it's an interesting look at. So yeah, the surge is definitely on rotation. Um, right. I have a master list of all the games that we will eventually stream. Uh, and I think we're at like 50, 60 out of like 280. The list grows faster than I can stream it. I mean, that's like my everyday life with games coming out. like. Mm -hmm. Fallout came out two days ago or like a day ago. Battle comes out in four days. Uh, I I mean I'm still playing. I'm still like in the tutorial for Red Dead because that's how much <laughs> you can do in that game. Like oh dude, I have It's even like hunt it. everything you want, and I'm just like what? <laughs> yep. Um, right. So who else snuck in? Oh, caffeine's here. What old friend? Uh, you met Caffeine very briefly. It was the massive dude I was hanging with at TwitchCon. Oh, yeah. yeah Hi, that's, how are you doing? That's Dan. Or oh, another Dan. There's always a Dan. There's always a lighthouse. Um, um, so, yes. Right. Um, God. The problem is, is that I brought up the Tiny Build page to share it to you, and then I started scrolling down, and I'm just like, yeah. uh, um, I'm actually... Um, yeah, it actually surprised me how many that I have uh, wishlisted and not um, picked up of the recent set. Well, I've, I've got like s like seventy percent of them. That. Um, but uh, I 
Wait, no, I definitely have... Wait, did you do a re-release of Lovely Planet? Because I definitely have Lovely Planet. So, I'm pretty sure we did a... We did something with it. I know we did something. Okay. Um, all right. But, yeah, for most of these... Yeah, most of these I am set for. Um, yeah, there's Lovely Planet Arcade. And then there's another. Um, I'm curious by Outpost Zero, uh, Garage Bad Trip, and uh, Phantom Trigger. Uh, well, Phantom Trigger is one one of my more favorite ones. Oh, uh, cool. Garage Bad Trip. That's that's another really good one in my opinion. That's that's a that's a mental one. That's a dude. That's a spooky mental one. Mental spooky we're good for. Uh, we did the hex this week, and I wouldn't do you the disservice of spoiling why you need to play it. But I wholeheartedly recommend I mean, it. If it's too spooky, like I don't, I don't play spooky stuff. Like straight up, like me and like PT, we weren't friends. Me and uh, oh my god, what's the what's uh the whistleblower? Um, Outlast. Uh, Outlast. Uh uh. I streamed that like I basically pooped my pants the entire time. That's like, it was it was horrible. That's visceral. However, I am not a um, good. Like spooky game player. What I would say is, did you get a chance to play through? Um, oh, why is my brain going blank? I need more of my delicious beverages. Um, did you get a chance to play through? See, Lucas. He Pony Island. Pony Island. Mm. What is that? Um, the only thing I will tell you is this game is not about ponies. Um, just play Pony Island. It'll take you maybe like uh, between two and four hours to finish. Uh, then you know. Then when you are feeling things, come back and then play the hex. It's both made by the same gentleman, and okay. the hex will probably hit you harder than Pony Island. But Pony Island is a great example of. I, I was talking about this with Cat. I spend so much of my day telling people, "Yo, you gotta play this game," and then they were like, "Okay, but what's it about?" I'm like, "I can't tell you because I'll spoil it." But you gotta play this game. Yeah, no. Um, there's there's a bunch of games like that out recently that you know you you're playing and it and it makes you think like uh, have you played Florence on the phone? No, I know the peeps who have made it and I haven't had one. Yeah, Florence is amazing. Florence is like that's that's a fucking that's an experience. That's okay. That's one I will definitely. It's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, so caffeine said they're only here for a short time. Uh, meeting a buddy for food and hangouts. Uh, Chris says, uh, Caf uh, this is Dan, saying, good seeing you again. You guys do some cracking work. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we try. <laughs> um, and Alpha the Deluge is dropping us some hot gaming news, which is apparently Sony is skipping uh, the 2019 E3. What? Interesting. So wait, they cancelled PSX, and now there's rumors they're not showing at E3? Um... All right, so this is all rumors and hearsay, but supposedly okay. they're ditching both the traditional booth, but also the press conference. I guess because this year's press conference was such a shit show that someone got dragged over the coals for it, and now they're just... Because, like, Nintendo's already shown you don't need to go to E3 to succeed at E3. No, you don't. But Nintendo also had, like, literal Nintendo land. Like, so. that was, like... When I was there for, like, Super Mario Odyssey, that was ridiculous. True. Like, they built, like, what what it, what was it called? I forgot. But they built the city, pretty much. It was oh, ridiculous. Yeah. New Donk City, I believe it's New called. New Donk City. I was going to say New Jack, but that's a movie. <laughs> yeah. I still think that New Donk City sounds like an offensive term to someone. I just don't know who. I mean... <laughs> And yeah, but I mean, I I enjoyed it. Sony just brought in like weird, weird things because they, they also had Mr. Caffeine one year, and that guy was just insane. Oh, Mr. Caffeine was Ubisoft. This year's was the one where they oh, made yeah. everyone keep moving venue, and then it broke and it didn't work. And anyway, oh, and Tal saying that because we scored them so low at E3 per bowl, uh, that's why they pulled out. E3 per bowl is our fake E3 coverage. Where we pretend that all the press conferences are like an American football game. We got dressed up, <laughs> did sports commentary. It was amazing. Wow, that <laughs> that was actually really funny. It was it was good fun. Um, right. So without further ado, as it's been a, a good fifteen minutes of of our traditional waffle, Nancy. 
Um, ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to Chris from Tiny Builds. Um, I've had the pleasure of drinking with Chris a couple of times and hanging out with him several more. And Tiny Build remains one of the most interesting and most dynamic forces in games. So to have one of their crew on is a is a big honor. So Chris, thank you for joining us, yo. Thank you for having me, Will. Thank you. So to give to give the humans out there some framing, who are Tiny Build? Uh, Tiny Build is an indie game publisher. We are a Netherlands-based publisher, but we have our roots in Seattle as well. Um, we are actually a team of about 21 at this point. You can um, drink in the US! Yeah. We can, like, our company can legally drink in the US. <laughs> <laughs> um, me, so I, I'm Chris. I'm an associate producer here. I also run... I also produce and run their events. Uh, I do a bunch of other things. I have my hands in all the things usually, but you know we get we got an amazing team over here. Um, our studio is mainly known for games like like Speedrunners, Cluster Truck, No Time to Explain, Hello Neighbor. Our most recent success is Graveyard Keeper. But you know we've we've made tons of games: Mr. Shifty, Diary Sports, uh, Diary Sports, Sports Janitor. Uh, Garage bed trip. Um, oh my god. I know. I said Mr. Shifty. Yeah. Oh, um, we got a bunch of new ones coming out on Dungeon, Swag and Sorcery. Uh, we have Hellpoint. Hey, I can keep going. Yeah. I just, that was like, I don't know how many. I mean, up on lot. Steam, you got like three pages. Um, and I guess to give a little bit of framing, so uh, by my understanding, first title under the Tiny Build brand was No Time to Explain. Yeah, it was No Time to Explain. Uh, a kind of a meta humor run and gun. Uh, yeah. Where you're sitting in your living room and your future self smashes through the side of the wall and goes, <laughs> There's no time to explain! And then a time crab, a gigantic time crab, picks up <laughs> your future self who drops their super weapon, which you must then pick up. And it just ends up in a. Yeah. It's chick as weird. That is one of the more funnier intros I've ever seen in a game possible because it's just immediate. Yeah. I... It's immediate as to what you're supposed to do, and I love that. I saw it first up on um, uh, the first, actually, the first Minecon. Um, I got to see a kind of a build of it kicking around. Now, am I correct in thinking that the gentleman that made No Time came from like a Newgrounds background as well? Yeah, no. Um, oh my god, I forget his name. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a new grounds title. And it did well enough to not only launch by itself, but become the, the founding block of now one of, yeah. you know, one of the core indie publishing labels. So whoop, yeah. whoop, it's got pedigree Our, is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, Our CEO and I forget his name right now. <laughs> I should really, really know it, but yeah, no, they, they made it. They got onto Xbox steam everywhere um so yeah um do you have any uh do you have any insight into at what point tiny build went from just making their own stuff to transitioning to publishing other people's just before oh. we get into the nitty-gritty yeah so it was after speedrunners okay speedrunners was the tipping point for going into publishing like it was literally like we have we literally have our entire story on on our website. Ooh. Yeah, do you want to do a dramatic reading of some of it? Or yeah, I could do a dramatic I, reading. It's whichever you prefer, really. I, I'll, I'll do it. I'll read it. Why not? Why not? Do About. You've you got to bring the, 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 the over-dramaticism. That is, that's yeah. the flavor we got here. Here, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> it all started as an idea. In early 2011, back when Alex was making web games, Alex is our CEO. He stumbled upon a small joke game called No Time to Explain. The concept had so much potential that he thought, hey, why not turn it into a full game and then release it on Steam? After some discussion with Tom Breen, the two decided to form a partnership label called Tiny Build. They kickstarted No Time to Explain, and the project hit its funding goal. Now, Tiny Build raised over $26,000 in the Kickstarter and got an additional $20,000 from Buka Entertainment. 
the we... Russian publisher that secured the rights for the game in Russian speaking countries. And they gave us the access to Steam. Unfortunately, Buka burned us as a company. By mid-summer 2011, the money still hadn't arrived. We had no access to Steam and only half our budget. Now, no time to explain was becoming a technical disaster. We didn't have the money to hire an additional developer anymore, so we decided to go down a new route to split the game into two parts and release the first episode in August 2011, followed by the second episode in December 2011. The first episode made enough money for us to finish the second, though we still had no access to Steam. <gasps> Releasing the second part resulted in next to no sales. This is a low. This is the lowest point. Everybody, now this is the part in the song where you go sad. Ah, oh. ah. Yeah. Uh, the Minecon wedding. In November 2011, Minecon creator Notch invited us to visit Minecon Vegas. I was at that. I, I, release I was there. party. Coincidentally, our friend Luke Burtis and his wife were there. Alex was dating Larica for a few weeks uh, before, and they decided to get married during Minecon. <laughs> Luke and Yulia ended up being the witnesses. Luke is um, part of. Tiny build. He's our COO. Yulia is our chief uh, for PR. Much of 2012 then went to then went uh, went by with nothing happening as Tiny Build sat in limbo. But then magic happened in September 2012. Steam Greenlight launched. No time to explain. It was one of the first games that access that went through the service. <gasps> It was Successful having, YAR! Having rewritten the game for Steam, we re-released in January 2013. Burned down, depressed, we finally saw our ideas to live and gain some traction over the last two years. A month later, Alex attended Casual Connect Hamburg and visited the Indie Showcase. By that time, we had enough money with no time to explain. We didn't want to keep making video games. We were tired and shaken up from the years before, this is where Alex stumbled across a game called Speedrunners HD. Quizzical Yar? Yeah. <laughs> it was a multiplayer running game that was released on Xbox Live, and also a Flash game, but with little but with little success. The development was also burned out working on their own game, and was about to release it on Steam. The game had potential, but lacked in visual appeal and usability issues. Speedrunners, the conference, was run by Luke Burtis, Casual Connect, who spent seven years running it and really enjoyed the vibe of the indie showcase. He wanted to work more in the indie development scene. And the idea was bored. Why not have Luke join us and use the money we made from No Time to Explain to help make Speedrunners a better game? We could take the marketing and business Alex showcases and distribution of Luke and then the visual aspects from Tom and give it to the developers with an to make their design and code a little bit better. In August 2013, Speedrun was released in early access and I was already past 3 million in sales. Successful YAR! And then after that, that is when the publishing idea went went live. So, and that's the, basically the origins of, of how Tiny Build occurred. Yay, with, and now uh, and now everyone's got the kind of the, the framing for where we go from. So um, it's weird because in my mind, I felt that it was, no time to explain had already, yeah. The timelines are fascinating, and uh, it's, yeah. it's weird how much industry stuff went filtered through that very first Minecon. That seems to be like a weird yeah, tipping no. point of an event. Well, I mean, it's it's Minecraft is a revolutionary title in the uh, in the sense that it is. I don't want to say it's the best indie ever made, but it's the highest grossing indie thanks to Microsoft buying them out for like billions of dollars. Very true, very true. And it showed that a small team can make something so uber successful that a multi-billion dollar company is like, no, uh, we want this now. Yeah, and it's also worth, I mean, I, I don't want to get too hung up on uh, Minecraft, but it's worth mentioning that, yo, that project launched on its own website. You yeah. still can't buy it on, on Steam or Origin. I think you can buy it on the iOS store, I guess? Yeah, it, it's on mobile. You can buy it on iOS and Android. You can buy it on Xbox, but it's not on Steam. Not on Origin. Yeah. Not anywhere. And it wasn't on Xbox until... I mean, like... Uh, it wasn't on Xbox until... Um, I know it was on the, the 360. Okay. Yeah, I know it was on the 360, but like late. Okay. Into, 
the development. So let's get into the fun stuff, shall we? Oh yeah, let's do it. Um, so okay, first things first. Tiny builds, t tiny build series of titles are so magically eclectic that I don't really know where to start. Um, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting is looking at um, uh, teams like Devolver and Chucklefish. Their their They're... philosophy is around an aesthetic. Yeah, no, it's 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 a devolver it's a devolver title. Yeah, yeah. like it's a if lot of their you... games have that that feel. It has that that look. Yeah. I mean, um, Chucklefish we... goes for like the the hard like lean into the nostalgia pixel flavor. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're all over the place. A lot of our games we we want to publish things that people want to watch, people want to play that exhibit well at cons. You know, so through that, you know, we we take all of that and then give it out to the world. I mean, because if you look at a game like we released Garage this year, yeah, as well as we had Outpost Zero go into early access. Those are two completely different spectrums of a game. One of them is a top down pixel based shooter twin stick. The other one is a first person sci fi survival game <laughs> oh see it's funny that you say that just as camille comes in because i know that's camille's wheelhouse uh actually uh as camille's here uh let me just do a quick reintroduction this is chris from tiny build uh i Hello, believe uh, i believe the two of you met very briefly at a sober and um yeah we are discussing indie publishing indie games and what in the bloody hell happened in this industry in 2018 everything happened everything happened so much a lot of things. A lot of things happened. A lot of just insanity. Lots of uh, world issues have breached into games, and it's now like yeah, gone very, very open to the public. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll bring it back to your um, your back cat in just a second. But it's interesting you mentioned like the real world um, effect of a lot of things uh, at the moment. You know, at the beginning of the year, it was like, get you a publisher that'll get you to China and your your yeah. woes will be solved. And um, the Chinese government have locked down on game licensing. No one's getting licenses right now. Tencent, um, was it Tencent's recovered from their massive drop this year, but there have been no new titles pushed through via Tencent. Like, the, the real world, the real world's coming a knocking. Yeah, no, um... I mean, speaking on that, like it's it's a huge it's a huge market. The thing is that even getting over there, yeah. you got to choose. Do you want mainland or do you want to be like in? Um, I think it's Beijing. I don't know. One of those two. Do you want to be in mainland China or do you want to be in like super duper like high density insanity China? And I'm... they're they're both split into well, what where do you want to get distributed? I mean, because one of them is hyperly yeah. blocked off. Um, so, yeah, I just, uh, I thought that was an interesting one because I was reading up on that this morning. Um, so, jumping back into your, your selection of titles. So, Fearless Fantasy was another early one, which I believe that's a long, that was a long-running Newgrounds series as well, yeah. which came on Steam. Yeah. Um, uh, Party Hard has possibly the best premise of anything, and I Hell think yeah, one that... man, that's my favourite. Everyone can relate to it in some way, so... Let me just let me just read you all the blurb. Most of you know this game. I just want to say it because it's brilliant. <clears throat> it is 3 a.m. Your neighbors are having a loud party. Stop them. That's it. Uh, you, through Done. means violent uh, or otherwise, need to stop the party next door. The video game. Yeah, you put on a put on a hockey mask and uh, you go a stabbing. Yep. Now, um, Punch Club, a lot of people know. Um, Punch Club is a very interesting one. And the what was really nice, and uh, again, another one I don't want to dwell too much on because I do want to get onto, you know, current tiny build. I don't want to discuss kind of like the games more. But so Punch Club, uh, for those of you that don't know, is um, a, oh, what's the best way to describe it? It's a management boxing game, I guess. It's a management fighting game. Yes where it pays a bunch of homage to like old school like beat em up martial arts movies like you know um uh oh like well rocky obviously um 
Yeah, I mean, no, there are can. there are crocodiles instead of turtles, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, teenage. It's just 90s, 80s. Just yeah. homage to all of that. And the game itself, stonkingly phenomenal. But what was really yeah, interesting... Yeah, that, that was the first game that we worked with Lazy Bear with. Oh, we cool. What did they go on to do after? Was it Graveyard Keeper? Graveyard Keeper. Yeah. <laughs> now, what was really good, and I think one of the things that cemented Tiny Build as not just another indie publisher and this is my humble opinion i don't expect anyone yeah. to come with me on this journey but during the uh the launch and post launch of punch club um uh was when the stuff with g2a was going down and if you missed all that drama uh <laughs> individuals of all persuasions uh g2a is a gray market third party key seller however one of the things they're most notably known for is keys gained by means most foul, then resold, then resold. Um, be they keys that have been stolen or from fraudulent purchases or from people who have gone to journal websites and been like, Ha! My name is uh, uh, Dave Journal and I deserve a five copies of your game for me and my friends because we are all journalists. And people then reselling them through that. And there was a lot, a lot of industry grumbling about these grey market sites. However, however, Tiny Build took a stand, going so far as to confront G2A at a panel, like, face to face. No, they confronted Alex. Wait, was it the other way around? So, yeah, Alex was talking I am talking so sorry, I got it wrong, Please. Alex was talking about that entire thing. And, like, you know, it was talking about the gray market and everything and, and, you know, like, how we're dealing with it and all this. And then someone there from G2A stood up and voiced. It was it was ridiculous. Yeah. I was at that GDC. Oh, dude. I, I like, was I at... Remember, like, seeing Alex after that. I was not a part of Tiny Boat at the time. But, like, I remember that was, that was a, like, that was a thing. That was crazy. Like, yeah. you know... Like being outside of it, like obviously you got some shady, shady crap going on in your company. You know, if you have one of the larger, you know, indie publishers being like, listen, you've, you, we've lost X amount of money because of your website, yes. because of stolen keys and everything else. And then you stand up being like, no, we're legitimate. Like, no, yeah. and that's like, you got some balls, dog, especially to like the CEO, yeah. like just not, not even like going up to the mic. Like, just straight up just stood up and was like, you're wrong. It was it was phenomenal. And, you know, GDC being GDC, like, that's a room full of industry professionals. And what was interesting is that everyone had been talking about G2A on the quiet, but no one else had really been making a stance on it. And so that panel, the G2A post response and Tiny Bill just being like, no, this isn't okay. You know, while... You can argue the back and forth of piracy. I I am personally against piracy, but that's just from being dev side for a long time. But you can argue it back and forth. But stolen keys is stolen keys is legitimately a lost sale to a developer. Buying stolen keys is essentially, uh, yeah, it it is uh, an equivocant to adjacent theft. But no one else was making a big stand on it and. And we saw Tiny Build do that. It was, it was really reassuring. It was, it was cool, and it would have been very easy for Tiny Build to not. Sorry, I'm putting statements in your mouth. I do apologize. No, 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 no. Because you're right now. You're you're speaking on on something that that occurred, and you know it it rocked the boat a little bit in the industry. Like, yes. I'm not gonna lie, and you know, like it. Yeah, no, we could have just. Like Alex could have just been like, "All right, whatever," yeah, and not and not been it. phased by it. But no, like, you know, me personally, if if I was in the same shoes, I'd be like, "Dude, like, you you're not in the right to talk right now." I would yeah. feel ashamed. Yeah. Like, I would take it in and then privately just be like, "Hey, like, let's let's converse about this." That you stood up, like that was crazy. Yep. Uh, it's the yeah. and PR no jitsu. They did not win. Um, Tiles just mentioning that the G two A um, the the Q and A they did after that was just insane. And because of Tony Bill taking a stance against something that was genuinely doing the industry harm, like while G two A isn't gone, like the the public awareness of it 
is is great. And uh, for those that haven't seen it, Tiles dropped a uh, a link in chat which you can go have a look at. And Scotty Doggy's like, G2A's boat needed sinking, not rocking. Oh, but the amount of money G2A was making was sickening. No, like, they were making a bunch of money. And uh, devs weren't making anything. Just stealing people's stuff. Bastards. Anyway, anyway. Um, that was, like, so that was, what, 2016? And that was... Yeah. For me, observing it, because I was dev side at the moment, that was the point at which Tiny Build went from being just another boutique to being a force in the industry, and it was great to see. Um, Speedrunners, yeah. What what can be said about Speedrunners that we haven't said already? That was the that was the gangbuster that's, success. That was our. That's I mean, people. That's what we're known for, in my opinion, is Speedrunners. I mean, it's Graveyard Keeper now, but like we show, we still show Speedrunners. At every convention that we're at, PAX West, South, East. If I could have shown it at TwitchCon, I would have shown it at TwitchCon. Yep. <laughs> like, everywhere. I even had people at TwitchCon come up and be like, hey, you got speedrunners here? <laughs> we want to <laughs> play. And I'm like, bro, if I had a television, I'd put it up. That would be like a dope thing. In fact, I should have done that. I should have had like a little like chill area with speedrunners there. Yep. Ah. The, the, the counterpoint damn. chill area. We have our yeah. fastest game. Um, now, yeah. uh, I'm just I'm skipping through the kind of the, the high points of this one. So another one that we have played on this show and loved wholeheartedly is the final station. I mean, where <laughs> where speedrunners speedrunners was a a mechanic and a gameplay style that just resonated. Um, yeah. The final station is art and craft. It's environmental it's story. Beautiful. Yeah, environmental storytelling, survival management all blended together and it does such a wonderful job of presenting you with what you think is going to happen and then not pulling the rug out from under you but by the time you finish the final station like i i i had to go for a very quiet walk and then go get a pint that game that game is something i still haven't finished it so i i mean because work got like insane i used to do a thursday stream on Tiny Bits channel every yeah. week. And the last game I was playing through was the final station. Now, now like, people are just like, oh, you can beat that in two hours. Like, whatever. Like, so I'm like, okay, cool. I'll probably get two streams out of it. Like, I got so into that game. Just, like, you know, yep. going around, reading everything. Like, that, that it, it was, like, at least four streams that I was playing the final station. I mean, like, my viewership tanked. Because yeah. it's such, like, a slow burn of a game. But, Indeed. like... Whenever, I mean, I don't know who, who hasn't played it here, but, like, when, you know what, when you see, when it starts getting weird, and you just start, like, you see all, like, the, the, the weird shit going on, you're like, what mm -hmm. the is going on here? Yep. Um, uh, now I need to pick another, actually, I'll just uh, do this, I'll do this OST one more time before I stop picking some other ones. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't played uh, The Final Station, it is wholeheartedly worth it um so the two things that were in chat that i wanted to quickly reference so scotty was saying that the public want a bargain and some of them don't care who uh but I, what i would say scotty is that at least from what i have seen like industry the industry analytics that i have access to is that we've seen a decreased use in gray market key sites since then because a lot of the time users users care about the games they care about and from their perspective they're like all right i love i love the fallout franchise i love it you know, I will buy that gr that awful Heineken vault beer they made for Fallout 4, which was gross, but it was branded up as Fallout 4, so I bloody drank like six bottles of it. Anyway, um, and you're like, okay, I love this franchise with my heart, but I need to be fiscally sensible. Okay, here are eight sites. Ah, oh, G2A has it the cheapest. Done. Their, their passion and their love for the franchise may not translate into industry knowledge. And so when Tiny Build took a stand, like, all the coverage that got in regular games media, suddenly people were like, wait a second, G2A is shifty as sh That's why it's so I cheap. Mean, but but even, even looking at that, like, yes, the public wants a bargain. But the thing is that, like, so there are people behind the computers that make the games that, you know, sometimes they don't even get a commission. You know, they, they, they get some sort of sale, they get some percentage, and, you know, it's it's enough to make the next game. So with that, like, oh, well, they want a bargain. Like, okay, well, that's a pretty shady-ass bargain when it's $60 on Steam 
and you're getting for five ninety nine. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> that's like I, at that point, I'd just be like, oh, okay, like sure. Yeah, and uh, sorry, like, Greenfire was asking, does Tiny Build have a Twitch channel? Yeah, we have a Twitch channel. Um, we're, we're we're we we have a partner channel. Is uh, it slash Tiny Build? It is Tiny Build. <laughs> Hey, Tal, like, Tal's on it like, yeah, yeah, Tal's right. on it like a car bonnet, and Tiny Build says hi! Dude, Chris, I don't want to alarm you, but I think Tiny Build might be in chat. Um, yeah. So, I know we're just doing, like I said, I, I wanted to do like a little greatest hits, uh, lap of the titles you have on Steam at the moment. So, Cluster yeah. Truck, um, stonkingly good fun. Also, um was famously enabled a bunch of like twitch integration stuff that no one knew about where the devs yeah. could message people playing it directly in resulting in some amazing moments yeah um streets of rogue we actually haven't i own streets of rogue we haven't streamed it yet it is on the list it's so good like there, there are like i saw that i'm like okay cool great cool but like when i sat down when I literally sat down to play it and like read the story, it's so funny. Mm -hmm. Like the currency in the game is chicken nuggets because <laughs> the president banned chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> the most like, valuable substance is chicken it's nuggets. So good. <laughs> oh, um, actually, while we're doing the victory lap, so Green Fire's asking, do you have any favorite games you played from this from the Tiny Build lineup? From the Tiny Build lineup, my favorite game has to be uh, Mr. Shifty. Yay! And I love Mr. Shifty. If you all haven't seen Mr. Shifty, um, kind of like a, a pulp-flavored yeah. teleporting Hotline Miami. It plays yes. stonkingly good. Your Nightcrawler Hotline Miami. Yeah. That's what it is. Now, my second, I would have to say my second one is, it's it's got to be Punch Club. I love Punch Club. And Wait a third, second. Hang on. Someone gifted Tiny Build a sub. When yeah. did that bloody happen? That happened last 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 stream that I was in. Freaking wet! I didn't even see that! <laughs> yeah, no, you were you were playing Let It Die. Oh god, yeah, that was a that yeah, was a cluster you were of a day. Playing Let It Die and and I was in the stream because I was doing a bunch of uh post post um TwitchCon emails. <laughs> God, yes, which is how we ended up getting on this one, dude. My, yeah. I'm, I'm down to probably about like nine cards. I've almost, I've almost got it done. Dude, almost. I, I like, I had to make, I had to like hand out some of these emails to RPR uh, to Yulia. <laughs> like I made a spreadsheet. I'm like, I don't have time to email them. Oh no, which is yeah. funny because I. No time to explain was the first title we mentioned today, which makes yeah. Um. So okay, quickly. Uh, I don't know much about Community Inc. and I haven't had a hands on with it, so I've got to put my hands up and say I don't know. Um. Phantom Trigger. I am salivating to be able to play. Love at some point. Phantom Trigger. Um. Now, Party Hard Tycoon was an interesting concept, and I, I'd be curious at some point to go into where that came from. Um, but you mentioned, so you mentioned speedrunners, but I yeah. think it's, I think bringing up Hello Neighbor is important because that was kind of the, that was the proof that it, that speedrunner wasn't a single lightning strike. Like, Hello yeah, Neighbor did no. the rounds. Hello, Hello Neighbor was, it still is a phenomenon for us. Yeah. Like, it's funny when, when, you know, I'm, I'm out in public and I was at a Microsoft store the other day. Yeah. And I saw this huge, like, ultra wide monitor. And then in the corner is the Hello Neighbor physical game box. And I'm like, wow. Dude, I what? can buy Hello Neighbor action figures and plushies. Yes. In we game store. Or game Action figures. We got a book. We got calendars. We got everything. We It's on mobile, it's on Switch. PlayStation 4, Xbox <laughs> One, PC, the deal, like literally the next, the next story, the prequel comes out December 7th. Like we're in this right now. Feck. That's feck like we got cool. Secret Neighbor, which I still have not played. If you're watching the Secret Neighbor devs, hi, I work for the Tiny Build. Let me play it. 
<laughs> oh yeah, get we'll, we'll get those lads in here. It'll be great. It'll be great. Um, and uh, last but by no means uh, least, you know, Graveyard Keeper and Party Hard Two, the the next ones. Um, yeah, I, I mean. Guts and Glory is one of those games I'm surprised no one else made a commercial version of first. Nothing personal, but like Happy Wheels was another phenomenon that I'm surprised no one cashed in on. Um, so Guts and Glory is what I'm looking forward to trying Guts at some point. Guts and Glory is amazing yeah. on uh, PC. It was actually our first simultaneous release on every platform. Are we cool? Same day. Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, and computer. We cool. Every day. Um, all right, so I want to jump back to, I wanted to jump back to Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor. I want to yeah. reference that one really quickly because um, one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of the tiny build titles is that it's very, there is a very clear gaming premise in all of the titles. You know, cluster truck, jump from truck to truck, Streets of Rogue. It's a roguelike Streets of Rage top down GTA One mashup. Um, Final Station, run a train, the last train. But Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor was something important, and it was something special. I'm actually the thing you, the happy tunes you're hearing at the end uh, behind you now are from that game. And for those that don't know the the premise of it, you play uh, a janitor in a spaceport. Uh, every day you have to incinerate trash to make money. There's only so many hours in a day you can work, and you've got to pay your rent each day. But also one of the mechanics in the game is. If you don't mind me going full highbrow on this one, Chris, is you're essentially dealing with a mechanic of gender dysphoria. Um, there are, I think, six or five genders in the game, which you have to flip between. One of them is prickly, uh, which made me laugh. Uh, but one of them makes you kind of like, uh, like glowing sun powers. I forget. Um, and it's been an interesting discussion point because while it doesn't give people real world examples it gives them the experience of at least what i have been told gender dysphoria can be like it can be discombobulating it can make you feel like everything is wrong and out of place like the fact that you can't focus enough to read things later on and dude that's an important title and your feckin' publishing team took that to market this isn't just some batshit itch.io free title yo how did that come about so a lot of the games that are pitched to us, um, sometimes you know you just you just see them at, at shows. Um, this was this was before me, but I remember when it was picked up, like because you know I I am a fan of, of Tiny Build and you know I was getting into the industry a lot more at that point. You know I was you know making my network a little bit larger. Yeah, and you know around that time is when the 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 social like norm of you know what is gender what is sex everything in in america as well as the world was was going on a lot of a lot of things and out came a bunch of of games i mean i i one of the games that i'm not gonna say it's kind of like it but i remember when depression quest came out oh, and yes. for me as a person that like severely suffers from depression like that like that 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 was like on the t like it was perfect like, yeah amazing now when this was picked up like it, it won awards and you know it's it's a great game i mean like it's i haven't played it yet because i've been so busy with work and life i mean i just i just moved to seattle like Yay! a year ago and everything you and me both but, <laughs> yeah no i mean but it's 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 crazy i mean like it's it's insano. Yeah, um, and oh yeah, I just I don't think I've got anything additional to add. I have not finished Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor. I've not gotten into the dungeons beneath, and I've not really seen how far that game goes in terms of like uh, narrative. But in terms of what we played and the experience it left me with, is something special, and I wanted to celebrate that. So we've chatted Tiny Build Games. Um, let us talk a little bit about the fecking cluster feck that has been the games industry in 2018. Because holy crap! I mean, Red Dead reschedule your launch was my joke for half the year, as everyone just got out the way. I, 
but that was the thing is that you needed to do that. Like it's, it's funny that. Uh, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love Call you. of Duty. I love Call of Duty like to hell. But that entire like rivalry of Call of Duty and Battlefield. I mean, when when Red Dead literally just dropped its launch last month. That was the funniest thing in the entire world. Yep. Like Call of Duty is like, oh, we're aiming to get like the biggest thing in the world, and then Red Dead just stomps it. Yes, with horse hooves. I, know, I don't even know what their sale is at now, but it's it's insane. Like it's still it's still freaking selling. Yes, and it's like stupid. I mean, I saw an article which probably was hyperbole, but just saying that uh, Red Dead Redemption Two had the strongest opening weekend of any piece of entertainment. Yeah, and it's like, like I don't think that's hyperbole. I think that was like that's completely true though. Um, like, and what was interesting about that is you know the reports of like the conditions of the devs working there didn't seem to affect it at all. Like, yeah, well, I can I can talk on that because that's that's a game industry thing that yeah, we dude. all suffer from and we all feel bad for. The public yeah. doesn't give a shit. Like, okay. It's good. You worked a hundred hours. Good for you. Now I'm gonna go play this game. You made a game. The public sees that as normal. And you know, but in in the industry, you know, crunches crunches a, a thing. I mean, I've I haven't been part of like that severe thing, but you know, like I've I've been in it. You know, testing games. You know, all that other type of stuff. You know, I've you know I've slept under desks. Yeah. <laughs> it's it. It shows you that you know, like, am I still gung ho to like keep doing stuff? Hell yeah! Like, I'm, I'm gonna. I mean, yeah. But it, do I still like not want to have crunch? Yeah, but I'm still gung ho as hell. But no, some some people that really don't care. They just buy the game. It's it's more of like an industry thing. It is, and yeah. Yeah, it's it's difficult because I have done uh, a level of I've done a ridiculous level of crunch. The situations in which I've done it have been somewhat self-inflicted. Though I've been part of one environment where it was something that was was mandated from up on high, and it yeah, all mine has been self-inflicted. Yeah, I've which... never been mandated to like work insanity unless you say packs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I probably should work, or should have worked less in those environments, but that was my choice and people would have been hard pushed to stop me, but... Um... No, I mean, I, at this point, like, when, when I overworked myself for one of our game launches, I, I worked myself into, like, it was bad. I took two days off. I mean, but, but even, even with PAX, I overworked myself with PAX. I was weak, I was sick for a week. And it yeah, wasn't yeah. PAX Pox, it was, I literally just... I was, I was dead. Yeah. Like my body just didn't want to go and work that week. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's been interesting. But on the flip side, because, I mean, the prolo is saying that there's some sort of an element of public not caring, but there's an awful lot of public not hearing about it. One of the things that I found really interesting about 2018 is there's now far more discussion, and far more knowledge available. Like we've got uh, shows like No Clip, People Make Games, Game Makers Toolkit, like actually going into the people who are making these games and how it is affecting them and where it's coming from. Yeah. Um, but but to answer one Mr. Ghost. Oh, go for um, it. Yeah, in university, I, we all slept under desks. It's it's a, it's a demanding thing. University is a job. But you know, when you have a job that it's you know. If a job state is like, no, you have to get this done, and it's for Saturday and Sunday as well, like that, that'll, you know, especially 100 hour weeks, that's that's five days nonstop. Yeah. That's five days no sleep, if you like legitimately look at it. Like that's, it's insanity. <laughs> it, 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 you will start to go insane. And, you know, it it's something that, yes, the game is, is a hell, it's super fun. I love it. You know, as someone that that's in the industry, yeah, no, it is crunches, crunches something. But do they make an amazing product? Yes. Was there crunch? Yes. Is that horrible? Yes. Should things be done? Should we proactively stop that? 
Yes. Can we do anything about it now? Yes. But we can't. It already happened. Yes. We found out about it, you know, years after. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I mean, because I mean, people are talking here about, like, you know, uh, people purchasing the game and not... Um, people not having industry exposure and not understanding. The thing that... The thing that really shocked me is that um, it's always been an open secret that working for Rockstar is hellish. Um, that's why they pay good. Well, yeah, it is, because it's Rockstar. Yeah. And, and and saying that, that's like a horrible thing for me to say. The thing is that, you know, they, they, they take five to six years to make a game. And, you know, it. if you look at their repertoire, none of them have got underneath a nine. I think none of them have got underneath 9.75. Um, I think Grand Theft Auto 4 yep. was a 10. Grand Theft Auto 5 was a 10. Red Dead is a 10. Red Dead Redemption was a 10. Um, Vice City, I think, was a 9.75. San Andreas was a 9.75. Yeah. Grand Theft Auto 3 was a 10. LA Noir was a 9.75 or a 9.5. And that was then uh, coming in to finish someone else's yeah. thing. And, and, and Bully... Bully was also a 9.5 nine, or 9.25. I don't know. But all it of them were 9. I still think Even it would have been ping yeah. pong game was a nine. They've consistently put out quality products, and it's they've done it yeah. with with blood and with with rocks. Um, now, quickly jumping back I mean, into chat, uh, I just wanted to uh, say hello to Baron Sheep because he'll probably have to show up and go. Um, and uh, what was the other? <laughs> uh, Super Freedom Fighter says, "Nice beard. Can I borrow it?" <laughs> nope. You got to bring your own on this ship. I mean, you know, it's bring bring a bottle, bring your beard, B Y O B, <laughs> or B O O B B. You get me, you get me. Yeah, it's it's there, but I mean, but even with with Blizzard right now, the thing is that there is such a move in the industry to like avoid crunch. Yeah, that it's it's you know, some companies are demolishing it. EA and PopCap, they they're they're trying to abolish it completely. I mean everything is is trying to abolish it like you know but some companies like when you know right now i'm waiting on assets i'm waiting on assets to to populate a store page hey i'm happy because that means we get you for a few hours yeah and 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 it's it's not that it's not that you know like oh i can rush it no 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 no, no. like I'm, I'm i have things to do but that can take months yeah in in other companies like Oh, well, we have to rig this. And then all of a sudden, three months prior, you have to rig every single horse and make, you know, testicle physics because the, the testicle artist was taking his sweet time drawing veins and making sure that the testicles shrink up perfectly. Oh, God. Um, sorry, I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, my job title, um, I, I, I thought it was going to say technical artist, but it seems to be a typo here. It says testicle yeah. artist. Is that is that a typo? <laughs> Yeah. No, you want me to literally work on horse balls for several, for several, for for a year, for over a year. You want me to work on horse on actual horse janglers, <laughs> and I mean, for a lot of people, that probably would have been the. Uh, you know what? I'm good. I am good. I am. But there we go. There we go. Um. Uh. Well. You know what? Oh, oh god, I made me jump. <laughs> Isagrid with a hundred bits saying, just bits to break Will's concentration. Well it bloody worked! Um So bring you back around. Yeah. It has been good that this discussion has happened, and Rockstar will be held accountable if this happens again. And uh I mean I always describe um the PR no jitsu as a big old it's a big old wall. Uh, anything that you try and push, it pushes back against. And the harder you push it one way, the harder it'll snap back. Um, the the comments that came out from Rockstar were very, very like, offhand. Like, yeah, we are so hyped to bring you this game. We're working 100 hour weeks. And everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They, Fair they, can't turned wait. It, they turned it around to be a semi positive. But but we all know that that yeah. would happen. Um, but the other thing that's been very interesting is. Um, I mean, as you know, the games industry is seasonal. During the 360 PS3 era, being a middleweight developer was death. You either had to be AAA or super lean indie. Um, 
right now we're seeing the situation where the AAA is doing all right. You know, it, they have the same life and death risks they've always had because they basically bet the farm on every title, except for Rockstar because they're an anomaly. But that's not the point. And Blizzard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Blizzard just. Although, I mean, Blizzard take their time, and from the people yeah, well, I know that Blizzard work there... Blizzard can sell me shit in a can, and I'll still buy it. <laughs> yeah, but it'll be really good. That's the worst part. It'll be the best shit in the can you've ever played. <laughs> yeah. I was so done with hero shooters, and they announced Overwatch could be a hero shooter. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm not gonna... And I did. And I did. I got it, and I played it. Um, feckin' Hearthstone. Hearthstone. Whatever. Anyway, anyway. Um, what... I have observed this year, and I'd be interested to know your thoughts and feels, is that um, the kind of the death of the alter indie, like where a couple of years ago we could have seen a single solo individual or small person team with no support just kick out the doors and be like, what ho, bum a game. And what I have seen over the last couple of years is that the likelihood of that happening has decreased so much. I mean, with that, it's, it's that... A lot of, I mean, getting on Nintendo Switch is is difficult. I mean, yes, and that's been this it. year's kind of like hot button maneuver, right? Yeah, I mean, getting on Xbox, like ID at Xbox and uh, PlayStation, you know, indies for PlayStation. Like, if you can get in contact with them, they'll hook you up. But it's getting in contact with them. It's giving them, you know, a product that that will show well that 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 people want to buy and play. I mean, the the auteur indie. Um, such as I, uh, I will use. I'm trying to think of one that just has. They didn't. They just self-published a thing. Um, none is coming to mind right now. So I'm just going to keep been, going. It's been a day. I'm. I'm going to get. Uh, I, I think it's going to be around time for coffee very early or tea yeah. or whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but like, you know, but I'm now not... that there's oh. there's like publishers that legitimately want to get games on market. Like you know, we want games on market. The thing is that there's a lot. Like, yeah. that's the reason why Greenlight shut down. Is that people were just flooding the store with with crap. Yeah. And I, I don't think we're, we're covering or saying anything super controversial. But, yeah. Um, discoverability is incredibly down. Now It's extremely difficult. I thousands, do want to... Oh, sorry. Thousands of games launch. Yeah. I, I do want to say that the good games sell themselves thing is a myth. I was thinking more of the like, um, like how um, uh, Vlambeer did it. Vlambeer have self-published constantly and they have their own marketing. They are their own sales. Like the before yeah, well, Rami, Rami was touring. Yeah, beast. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't <laughs> think, even if someone had Rami's abilities, I don't think they could achieve the same level of impact in this current climate that's that's my feel i guess that's what i was trying to put across yeah i i would i would agree but you know if if you want it you you go get it like if you want it enough as it you know whatever in life you want you can achieve now some things are impossible such as oh well i want to go to space i can do that like i can pay <laughs> spacex to like fly me out like sure why not I mean, but as I know, it's expensive. See, that, that's that's where I mean. But there, there's a bunch of stuff. Whatever you want, you can go and get it. Like you know, I wanted to get into the game industry. Like that's that's something that I put all of my passion into and all my time and resources. Like you know, I've slept on couches and everything else. But you know, I'm here now. I did it. Yeah. Like I'm, if you want something, you can go do it. Indeed. But there are going to be a lot of, and some of them might be might be short. You can just hop over some of them. You can climb, and some of them are like seventeen feet tall walls, and they're yes. just like glass. You can see what's on the other side, and you will never get over it. I find it's you don't always understand what it is that you want until you get the chance to have it. Um, uh, so okay, that was really that was a terrible sentence by me there. I do apologize. What I mean is that you know I would not have expected that I would have gone the path of doing like community front facing stuff i always thought that like the creation um the creation of games was the the avenue i was going to go down and yet here oh, i am yeah. yelling about video games five days a week from my mate's house i'm having a bloody brilliant time with this um, yeah no i, I having the goal of having a triple a budget and making triple a game might be unobtainable but making your own game is an entirely attainable dream essentially 
well, yeah, no, there's so many things out there. Like, if you want to make a game, you can go, you can make a game right now. Game Maker, Unity, I mean, uh, Unreal. I mean, if you if you want to make, like, a game, like, quick, RPG Maker. Yeah, dude, I cut my teeth on uh, RPG Maker and the uh, Mugen Engine. That's how I started out. And then I tried uh, the Cube Engine and Save of Brawn and a bunch of others. And then, yeah. then life happened. But that's another story. That's another story. Um, so the reason why I wanted to use this as framing is that as part of Tiny Build, as what they have done is they have taken interesting titles and brought them to market. So the question that everyone probably asks you on inordinate amount of times, how, how does one get to someone like yourself? How does someone get to an indie publisher, to Tiny Builds? We've got, you know, we've got this, um... Oh, what was the was it the left-handed car driving sim or something? Darn it! I came up with a great fake concept the other day. Anyway, uh, we want to make the game adaptation of Endo Team. We want to do that. How? What could one equip themselves or their team with when discussing with teams like Tiny Bill when trying to take these things forward? Because your your perspective on this is wonderfully unique. So, when you want to take a game to a publisher make it like don't don't bore me with like like paragraphs break it down explain it have gifts have if you can shove in a demo have 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 your pitch deck ready like the 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 amount that that i've seen so far like i've seen some that oh do research on the company if your research if your company hasn't released mobile games in in four years don't don't pitch them a mobile game there, there are mobile publishers like as well as you know if 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 the last game that that they did or one of the similar ones is the thing you're making then don't don't pitch it to them like i i know for a fact so so we'll say team fortress we'll say overwatch like if if you're pitching a hero shooter well what is different how how is it different how are you going to execute on it you got it you have to sell me on that because at this point if you want to if you're giving me a unique idea we will be interested but you have to back that up you have to i want to i want eye candy i want to visually see what is being represented i don't want just being like hey we're making a game we're out of here this is it and then i don't get a i don't get a demo i don't get a pitch deck i don't get a trailer like come with it yeah if you if like we actually have how to pitch indie games on our website way cool like if you, actually, yeah let me let me dig that re- uh you beat me to it um yeah i mean the thing that i i add to people in that situation is that the the closer your game is to launch the more complete it is the the higher your chances the better your the better your conversation the more that you can yeah. show that you can deliver the better a chat you're going to have with the publisher I mean, I posted it right there. That's Thank how you. to pitch your game. Like, as well as there, there's 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 a bunch of GDC talks and stuff like that that are on YouTube on how to on how to pitch your game in in a con setting. But that can also come as a publisher because publishers, if you can pitch to thousands of people, you can pitch to two dudes in a room. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. One of the things that uh, I've done in the past, and I don't know if this is everyone's wheelhouse, but um, I've actually, uh, so for like um, comic conventions and things like that, I've volunteered to help out individuals who have indie comics and stuff like that, and just be essentially their uh, their booth helper for the weekend. And learning that high speed pitching stuff is very good for getting a point across quite clearly. But that's another story. Um, and uh, yeah, I apologize to moving it onto this one because I'm sure as an indie publisher at the tiering you are, the amount of individuals <laughs> that must come to you far no, too early. I love, I love I love talking about it though. Like, you know, even if you come too early and you have something unique, pitch it again. We will we will give you feedback. Yeah. Way cool. And I guess I want to go back to an earlier question, yeah. which was uh, we were discussing about kind of the eclectic nature of the titles in the Tiny Bill catalogue. And yeah. how did that come about? Because th- I-, I can't imagine what the pitching criteria must be for you guys. 
So, um, a lot of our games are from amazing Eastern European developers because okay. we are a Netherlands based company. So, like Alex, uh, Larica, which runs DevGam, which is also um, Alex's wife. Right now, DevGam is actually going on yeah. in um, I Minsk. And, you know, DevGam is a huge, like, indie, you know, video game convention. Yeah. And, you know, Alex and, you know, it. Tiny build is, is is decently in there, so we they meet a lot of people over there. Like and you know we get pitched a bunch of games to like the Netherlands based office, and from there like some amazing titles come out. Like there are amazing developers over there. Like yeah, we we get a bunch of games pitched to us like a that we see at shows and and on a daily basis. But like a lot of the ones from Eastern Europe, you know, we we tend to gravitate towards that because a lot of our team that that's. A lot of the, the porting team, the dev teams, they, they that's their native thing. They can natively do that, same time zone, everything else. So, I mean, but over in America, like, uh, Outpost Zero is an American-made uh, game. Uh, Hellpoint is up in Quebec. But both of these are amazing titles. And, ah, you know, it's, it's from the Northlands. The dark, yeah, frozen are, north. We're, we look for we look for titles that will show well that we can show at expos decently that you know have replayability like a lot of these things are like very big for us like mr shifty you can keep playing like that that's a fun game graveyard keeper i mean it's basically never ending we got oh my god i don't know how many dlcs we got planned but but we got dlcs planned like the the, the random you know like uh zombie one straight up spawned like when i was at uh twitchcon it just dropped i yeah. didn't even know about it yeah that just happened yeah <laughs> gotta love those challenges um god i had an excellent point and it dropped right out of my head as i started making jokes about canadians i do apologize no, that's that's literally um, what happens to me so i was eating a banana downstairs and i'm like i gotta do something and i'm like okay i'm gonna do it and as i went to go throw it out i'm like crap what the fuck was I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well done, banana. Well, so one of the things that I wanted to ask you while I desperately try and remember what it was, um, was that what are some of the challenges that come up from working with developers, not just from multiple regions, but from multiple languages? Um, so one of the one of the major things that comes up is, you know, I ran, I do, like, I'm a big part in the QA effort is that sometimes you know the translation from me writing a bug is and then translated to like russian is is completely wrong so that the bug won't be fixed on a timely manner or sometimes their their qa teams or their um like feature list that is that is uploaded you know we can't read or so we're just blind I mean, for me, it's the time difference. That that's that's the one thing that that messes me up is that you know if we're if we gotta get a game into certification in five days, and I'm testing it here, and I have um, and I have a game breaking bug, like I got like literally, I can log it and I can keep playing, but I'm still gonna keep running into this game breaking bug until like they wake up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, uh, Bramf was quoting a wonderful game, just saying. Getting what you want isn't hard, but it'll change you. And that, my friends, is what's hard. And that's from the cave, my good old double fine. Yeah. Um, and I cannot second enough how much of an ass hat time zones are. Because uh, I was in New Zealand for like a year and a half. And so it meant that anything US based was not only in the few, was not only ahead, but a day ahead. So I not only had the feckery with time zones, but also dates as well. <laughs> yeah no i mean i i'm an east coaster for life and moving over here to like go three hours back in time was like, time travel's crazy. weird um, yeah no time travel is insane so i'm gonna pull out uh the question rhymes moose has got with us and i do want to say everybody like this is a super this is a super chill chat if you've got any questions for chris be it you know how to pitch a game advice and tips indie side like um which is the correct flavor of red bull answer is orange oh um, no uh uh blue <laughs> blue but Dude, blue and regular 
Regular, a regular and a bacon sandwich was my feckin' routine for a while. I'm still <laughs> amazed I haven't had a heart explosion. But, so Rhymes and Moose wanted to put forward, so, bit of a question. Uh, how would one go about pitching system-driven games that don't really come together until the systems are actually in place? Uh, what just happened? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you just cut out like halfway through. Uh, it's probably the power of the question of Rhymes with Moose. Yeah. Uh, so Rhymes with Moose was asking, um, how would you go about pitching a systems-driven game? One of those uh, titles that stacks until it all comes together. So if you have a mechanic, a system, show off that. Show that off. Show have have a separate be like, listen, this is this is what we're doing. You know, have concept, and this is the the mechanic that we're working with. That is that is how you can do it. Now, like I understand that things are gonna have to be like stacked on top of it, and then it's all gonna come full circle. But we want to know what that component is. If you're if you're gonna be like, listen, it's uh, you, you it's a pogo game where you're a pogo guy, but every single time that you pogo. Uh, dynamite explodes and then you use that to propel yourself forward because it's actually a physics based uh, platformer like okay well I want to play an exploding pogo I actually like, have that game on Steam it was a yeah. comedy gift I just have to play yeah. it yeah like I want <laughs> I want that pogo prototype I want to whenever I pogo to the ground I just get launched up like make a stupid level like yeah I want to see that so what you're saying is that aim to have Aim to have these systems that affect the core mechanic in first. Like, they give, they give someone else the most amount of understanding as to what the experience could be. Would that be a, a good way of putting it? Yeah. Give me what it's going to be. I want to see the, the tad bit, but give me a taste. Yeah. Give me a taste so I know that I'm, I'm what we are investing in is the proper thing. And also, oh. rhymes with moose. No, the correct flavor is yeah it's not sugar free thank you <laughs> hey i if told you, you drink sugar free red bull there's something wrong with you yeah I knife mean, hands at this point you're already well i was gonna knife hand and and i don't know what this is like broken spoon hand but you're already yeah. drinking a red bull at this point what are you thinking about your health <laughs> Um, so Bramford suggesting um, fake it for a vertical slice example of one piece to show how it might come together in the final experience so um, I wouldn't even fake it in vertical slice just give some sort of vertical slice give me something yeah like you know you don't you don't have to just be like because then at the end if, if what you pitched in the beginning isn't like what it is and you're changing it that that, that looks bad just a tad bit yeah it's Think about the experience you're putting forward. So here's a couple of examples, one and all. Let's say that you are putting together a... Uh, actually, let's go for the Party Hard soundtrack, because that one's really good. Uh, Party Hard game soundtrack. Sorry, bear with me all just a second. Uh, there we go. A little bit, little bit chipper, a little bit upbeat. Um, so let's say that you are creating a roguelike... A uh, cooking game about seven different fish that all represent different styles of cooking. Okay. So what you wouldn't need to create for the vertical slice is all seven fish. You no, wouldn't need I to. No, I don't. I don't care about the seven fish. I want to. I want to know how the rogue leg cook. Exactly. So you want to show the cooking. Now, the systematics yeah. behind the rogue like element might not be functioning perfectly. So maybe you construct a. Uh, a sandbox level, an example level that shows where you want to take it. And then you can give examples on the roguelike and the procedural generation elements of the levels. But you can say, right, if you play this pre-constructed level with this one pre-constructed fish, this is how the cooking element comes into the rogue crawling and comes together. So you've not had to create all the systems in place. Now, I mean, it's that old thing of like, if you have enough cash or enough dedication and focus to create the entirety of your game and then go to a publisher that's perfect but we are i mean for the sake of this conversation i am assuming the person in question does not have full funding to take it to market and um, the other example i'd use is if you wanted to make like a um, uh, like an open world science game um you do not need every scientific 
regular life. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you don't need every scientific chemical uh, reaction ready to go, but you do need, you know, to be able to show how the realistic elements will affect the user, the size of the kind of environments that you expect, and what's going down. Um, uh, also, if you want to go uh, grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, good sir, I am more than happy to keep this chat uh, lightly warmed, toasted, if you will, on this wintry day, <laughs> because that way I then have an excuse to do the same in about 40 minutes. <laughs> um, I'm going to get some water. You go do that. I will chat with these lovely folks. I'll get them to cook up some Perfect. good questions for you. I'm just gonna cut my 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 feed real quick. Yeah. Who knows what will happen? It could get crazy. Yeah. You never <laughs> know. Everyone can just start exploding. No one explode. This is an explosion-free zone. And I can use my cute buttons. I can be like, yo, whoa, whoa. Um. So yeah. Uh, quickly check things. Oh, well, the stream live thing did go. Oh, God, what's that? No, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. It's like, don't, Discord, don't give me like four feckin' announce things. Okay, okay, I'm back. So, uh, <laughs> Alpha the Deluge says, it, Everyone exploded. I told you to. Uh, there's one thing I told you not to do. Don't explode. Um, but how did you all feel about that in return, in response to, you know, vertical slice construction? Because it's something I have a little bit of experience with, and it's something I'm happy to share. Um, Scotty's saying the best low energy sugar drink I've come across is Hamilton Monster. Is that like, sponsored by the musical Hamilton? I'm thoroughly confused there, Scotty Doggy, but I really want to try it. Hey! What ho, Fiona! Welcome! Hello. Um, so to those of you that might have joined us over the last, like, I guess 40 minutes or so, uh, I've been joined with Chris by Tiny Build. He is a producer over there, and we are talking indie games, indie publishing, 2018 being a fecking hot mess, um, and all the stuff that goes along with it. Uh, so yeah, it's been, a, it's been a good little morning. Vanderbeast, no! No, it's, we, those don't explode. An isocrid with cyber explosion. I'm still sorry. So, if any of you have game projects that you are cooking up, if you want to know more about, you know, the boutique indie publishing scene, now is the time to ask. It's something that doesn't get discussed enough. But let's be honest, all just for a moment. Very few of us would go from where we are right now to being at a decision-making level in a AAA environment. Like, the rarity of that happening anyway is slim. But the chances of any one of us coming up with a concept and taking it to an indie publisher are very high, because right now, that is what I would advise you to do. Unless you have the focus and dedication to make a game, to spend one to three years developing a game and release it by yourself, which most of us don't, or we'd have done it already, this is a situation you may find yourself in. So now is the time. Cook up them questions. We have a we have a wealth of information at our disposal. Let's feckin' use it. This is why I like bringing these guests on. Um, I wish Javier Fed was here, but there we go. Um, Bram's saying, so, can a publisher like this help connect a dev with the elements of productions they don't have, such as musicians? Most likely. Um, so, I don't know what the formal structure is, and Bram, I'm going to pose your question back to Chris when he returns. But what I've noticed is the indie scene's real small, and everybody knows each other. It's entirely possible. Like, if you had a paid gig that needed a musician, there are a couple of people that I can recommend you, personally, because I know them. I can only imagine that an indie publisher would have the same or greater contacts than a numpty like myself. Uh, and then we got Rhymes just saying, Vertic uh, vertical slicing is actually something I have trouble figuring out for a project I'm working on, since it's very much about some complex interactions between scenes surfacing to the player in interesting ways. Um, it's real hard, Moose. It's real hard. But thinking about what the user experience is going to be on that one. Is that, is that a Chris? Have we got a Chris back? Yeah. Hey. Da -da 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 -da. Um, so the... your your viewers increased by ten when I left. <laughs> 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 
No, dude, they were. I see how it is. They were at forty-five before you left. I lost four Chris fans. Oh my god. I lost four Chris fans. Um, and honestly, I want to say thank you to everyone coming by today. I know we're a talk show talking about the intricacies of boutiquing and publishing in 2018, and we're going up against fecking Desert Bus. So, <laughs> thank you all for coming out. I do, I sincerely appreciate it. Um, now, what I was saying uh, while you were off um, making friends with uh, hydrogen and oxygen... Yeah. Um, so Bramf was making said an interesting question, which was, could a publisher like Tiny Build help me, a dev, make contacts with the elements of production that they don't already have access to? Now they use musicians as an example, but things like, you know, translation, certification, yes. porting, localization, certification, porting, everything. So what a publisher will do is we just don't, we will fund you for your title. If you can take care of all of that, sure why not? We'll fund. You. Um, but you know, making a game is hard. Yeah. And, you know, translating everything into you know seventeen different languages is also not an easy task. Oh, I remember well when it was as... just efigs. It was so yeah. easy when it was just efigs. It's yeah. not efigs anymore. So, and then also like getting you know getting your 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 store assets onto Xbox, Nintendo, Steam. PlayStation. All of this is a different process. They all use different things. They all, they're all different. So yes, a publisher will be able to help you with that. Yeah. Um. Uh, Stompasaurus just screamed, nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Stompy. I don't want to say this, but we're not trapped in here with you. You're trapped <laughs> in here with us. <laughs> um. Now, Rhymes and Moose was saying that vertical slicing is something they've been having trouble figuring out. Um, they're working on a project and they're very much about some complex interactions behind the scenes surfacing to the player in interesting ways. Now, I would say, think about what the like the end user experience would be. Like, if you just blue sky it, what would be the magical scenario and how would the user interact with that world and what would they experience and see how much you can, how much you can demonstrate with what you have. That would be mine. Do you have anything to add on to that, Chris? No, you you stated if show what you can show what you have, that will then like equate to what it's gonna be. Like, cause you can always add, you know, making something out of nothing is is, is pretty hard. Yep. Like if you're like, okay, cool, I have a platformer, but then halfway through it, it's gonna become a three D platformer. Like, no. Let's take a pause right now. The end. Like, you can make it like the Messenger did. You can make it go to, like, 32-bit instead of 16-bit. Yep. And like, there have been some really good talks on the Messenger and how they... Such uh, a good game. So Love good. Sabotage. Like, Terry and Martin, great friends of mine. I don't oh, actually, my God. I don't actually know them personally. I can only speak volumes to their work, and their work is phenomenal. But they did also say that they thoroughly regretted... Um, some of the methodology behind how they constructed because they committed early to this dual art style that you could leap between and that yeah. created a lot of work for them well yeah no I, I remember talking to them about also one thing you're cutting in and out oh, I or do apologize just... uh, it might be me coming through to you I do apologize um, still experimenting with new mics so yeah um the other thing is if you want to be able to do something complicated like that show that you can deliver if you can deliver the 2d part and then say but at halfway through it's going to turn into an emotional walking simulator with a management strategy level then everyone's gonna be like all right mate Come, okay. ma maybe when you've made that let's let's take a step back let's, yeah let, yeah but if you can show elements of both and that you can deliver them in a vertical slice environment that's not a bad shout um i mean once again there's no wrong answer when you're creating your game it's just when you are asking someone else to give you money to finish it that's where the complication comes in this is my humble opinion and once again to stop me if i'm going off into crazy will's been spending too much time alone territory because <laughs> i'm starting to feel a little bit like the old man of uh, old man of publishing on the hill. Back in my day! Oh, back in my day! Which is a vertical I mean, slice that, everything. That everything, everything has changed. Yeah, and it changes so fast. Yeah, it does. 
Like yesterday, I was literally putting stuff onto this uh, the Steam uh, Steam store for one of our games, and you now have to do a maturity survey. Do you, do you still find flatulence amusing in the workplace? Basically, yes. but no, it was like this: you <laughs> game of blood and gore, sexual references, and like yeah, and then you like explain. I didn't. I didn't do this. Like I don't think anyone else did this prior. Like I asked my boss. And he's like, no, never did that. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things I noticed on the upcoming uh, Steam titles was how many games with hentai in the title are coming up. Like, there was at least two or three per page of upcoming titles. So I guess... Well, yeah, these visual novels, hentai games, Steam, they're taking over. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them were simplistic, puzzle, probably Game Maker-style title, but with, you know, adult art. So something you can bash out in four months, no problem. Four months. That was like a weekend. Uh, also, the bash out wasn't meant to be a reference, and I do apologize. There, I was not thinking. Uh, like, like there are good games like that. Like Honey Camp Studio is great. Honey Pop is great because that's an amazing connect. Yeah. And it's also a good dating sim, but like those two are good. Like I, I don't know any other one right now, but those just stuck out because they were they were good games. One of them is a really good management game. Yeah, and you could also argue that because of the success of the Honey Pop titles, proving that there is a market on Steam, yeah. there's no unlike with a lot of other titles, there's a very clear path in how if you like a strategy game like Civ, you can go from Civ. To Endless Legend or Civ to Total War or Civ to Company of Heroes, like however you want to go from there. Yeah. But, um, uh, sorry, I was just jumping back into chat. <laughs> um, they were talking about, yeah. Oh, and Scotty Doggy was talking about how people used to be amazed by uh, parallax side scrolling. It's still, yeah. It still amazes me. It's still so cool. Or, when someone finally explained to me, um, like, palette cycling, the one where you can get those really, like, psychedelic colours in classic era games by cycling the palette to make it do stuff, I'm just like, how did someone come up with this? <laughs> oh, but that's another story. That's another story. Um, so, what are some of the other quirks you've seen pop up this year? So, aside from Steam changing their, their, their submission process every five minutes. Um... Hmm. Quarks. Quarks in the industry? Uh, as Well, from what you've seen from publishing side. Oh, uh, from publishing side, it's... Uh, every... Had a bunch of battle royales! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, you really need to play the Hex. You really need yeah. to play the Hex. I keep wanting to reference it in conversation, and I can't because I'll spoil it. Okay, is it on Steam? It is the on Hex? Steam. Huh, it's just 10 bucks. Okay. Take you six hours, and then I will have someone else I can talk to about it. In a creaky old tavern. Okay, wow, this looks weird, dog. Yup. You didn't think I was going <laughs> to recommend some fucking sensible... I, I don't know. <laughs> sensible looks... chuckle, the video game. Yeah. Um... I mean, so, referencing the quirks that we've seen already, you know, as you were saying, the push towards the Battle Royale format, and I do feel yeah. that Battle Royale is a far more inclusive format than the atypical deathmatch that used to be included with every oh, every God, console game like, for no reason. Okay, yeah, but like Call of Duty's take on Battle Royale, it's basically Call of Duty just in a huge environment. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Like, the thing that... But it's not fun! It's... <laughs> I have been drinking coffee and other things for several years. I can't play COD anymore. I just get wrecked on by some. I, literally, I got the new one because some of the people in my in the office got it to play on launch day, and I got it. And you know, like I'm watching them play, and I and I missed that that multiplayer, that fast paced twitch shooter, that you know, once you get into a rhythm, you just start like banging yeah. it out. And so I got it, and I played with them, and you know it was it was fun. And then when we tried the, like the battle royale, I'm like, I really just I, like Fortnite and you know all this other type of stuff, you know PUBG. Like I want it like 
I'm literally like aiming. I'm adjusting shots and everything. Where in reality, I just place the the cursor on him and shoot, and he start, and he gets hit. And I'm like, oh my god, this is so easy. I I think to my name in PUBG, I have like 20 kills. I had 20 kills in one one battle royale game of Call of Duty. Hey, I, I mean, my personal philosophy with the format is that because it says there is only one winner, but there are a hundred contestants. It's more inclusive than the my team versus your team or the uh, the the traditional deathmatch. Um, yeah. Now the other quirk we've seen very much in 2018, which I thought wasn't going to continue, but here we are, has been um, essentially platform chasing. Um, the Switch is making everybody money right now. Um, you can get on the Switch. You can make more than a few good bucks. And I mean, but but wouldn't that I mean, wouldn't that be like for every every new shiny? Because you know, I remember when um, Xbox Arcade was out, and that that was a big thing. Yeah, I remember when you know, like your PlayStation, you know, when you play, uh, games with PlayStation, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah, uh, that was a, that was a thing that you can get on. Um, you know, games with gold was another thing you can get on. Now it's now Game Pass, and you know, all these all these things that 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 allow you to get your title out there to a massive audience and then get some funding immediately. Yeah, like getting on the Nintendo, like. Yeah, everyone and their mother was pitching indie games, and you're like, "Yeah, cool, great." And only some were selected, but like, like this, it's it's because it's a console you can take every with you. It's not going to be the best. Like, you know, I I love Hello Neighbor to death, but like the Switch version is it's it's not. Okay. It's not going to be it's not going to be like the Xbox or PlayStation one, but you can you can play Hello Neighbor everywhere. Okay. I mean, all I can really comment is um, that we've seen a lot of developers charge to the Switch and well, do yeah, no. do well fiscally. Yeah, no, I mean, people are, you know, going and just being like, oh, I'm going to try for the Switch and hopefully I get it. Whereas, you know, in in my in my opinion, I, I would, you know, I don't got a Switch. I know a bunch of people do, but it's... If your game fits it, chase it. But if you can get an Xbox or PlayStation, like that's also a great, a great thing. That's also like a big, freaking achievement. Okay. Like, so and people, yeah. No, no, I really want to touch on this point because I think we've been focusing too much on not as in not you and I, but I think like yeah. industry conversation wise, we've been focusing too much on, uh, on the, on the trend chasing, um, and. Like in 2018, if you are able to get your, uh, if you are able to get your title onto a console, is that still successful? Is that still viable? Back in the day, you get your game onto, you know, Xbox Live Arcade, and you're guaranteed a chunk of sales. Is well, that... yeah, it's. I mean, to me, getting my game on Xbox, dope. Yeah. Like, for me as a developer, like you know, getting getting a title that even if I made would get on steam like that would that would be amazing like hell yeah um but past that i just like you need marketing now <laughs> because there's a lot of games coming out on xbox and playstation and steam then I mean, there's not that many getting on switch that's why the switch is like oh then let's let's bring up the uh, the unfortunately under-referenced elephant in the room, which is apt when you think about the topic. Let's talk about marketing. Now I mentioned earlier that the there is a misnomer that games sell themselves. Now you and I both know games don't sell they themselves. Don't. It would be Unless lovely if they got did. Something like Broforce. Yeah, but then they did a feckin' crossover with the Expendables. Like, yeah, they they did it's, some insane uh, stuff. Yeah, but their game literally sold itself because it was hilarious. <laughs> well, you know I what I'm, it. you know what I mean. Like, yeah. there's it's very rare that there is no involvement from the developer in how it gets found and used. Um, 
I've been using Undertale as a good example because we're all hyped on Deltarune, but, you know, Undertale was made by a bloke who knew Andrew Hussey. And Andrew Hussey made a thing that a lot of people read. So when he's like, yeah, my mate made this game, that initial surge of people onto it, yes, Undertale had a very high quality threshold, so it didn't have as much of a drop off in interest, but that initial push came from connections. Um, with the hypersaturation that we're seeing in 2018, obviously I'm going to say this because it's both my wheelhouse, but marketing's bloody important right now. No, marketing is. I was. I did influencer marketing as for indies prior to working here. And you know, yes, you know, I'm I'm in production now. You know, like I have a degree in game design and, and a bunch of stuff. And you know, I have attended every North American PAX uh, since 2013. Like you know, I see what people are doing. I see that that going to cons is important, but is the right con. Like it's the time. It's when you you can display your game, where you can be. Like the marketing is so it's so stupid. How 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 much it's needed. I mean. To the point where I mean, if, if you don't if you don't hear like the the clickety clacks going on by my side, like we we just got an amazing community manager to help us out in in a marketing effort. CMs represent. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, and it's and it's crazy as well as influencer marketing and people that stream. That's an entire thing in itself. There's traditional. There's, you know, you can be an influencer manager. There's every, everywhere, everywhere. You can run ads on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Fuck, you can run it on Tinder if you want it. It has worked. Um, I've seen a, a couple of um, uh, potential viral campaigns where they've created comedy characters on Tinder around gaming conventions and just matched up. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, hey, it's Fiona is in there. CMs unite. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, also, Dr. Pepper Pepsi Pun Guy said, Evening chat, Homestuck. All right, I managed to almost get through a show without referencing Homestuck. What do you want from me, people? So, <laughs> um, now, Dr. Ghost is asking the straight up question, and I think it's a good one to discuss because we've got some crew in here. So, influencer marking question mark? What even is that? Like, sending review copies to streamers? Not that they're taking it down, they just, they know almost nothing about marketing. So do you want to give some framing on that side of... So influencer marketing is gaining people such as streamers, uh, YouTubers, uh, content creators to take your your title and play it, review it, give it some sort of feedback. Whether it is public, whether it is private, you know, you are getting something back from it. Now, when I was doing influencer marketing, right now it would be... Uh, I did... In, in the current scent would be micro influencer marketing. Okay. Versus I was doing affiliate marketing when, when like Twitch affiliate system was like really big. I would find as many affiliates as possible because I believed that having on launch day 42, 32, or was it 38? 38 affiliate streamers that concurrent got, got 50 to 80 viewers was a lot better than getting two or three partner streamers that generate at least 500 each. Now, yeah, but a partner streamer, they, they're getting better deals from, from larger people. And, you know, I can't fund that on, on an indie budget, especially when, you know, I, it's just me doing the marketing thing. But I, what I can do is for affiliates is promote your stream, give you a key, be in chat, answer questions, help you out, you know, be there with you. And you play my game, hell yeah! I'll give you a time slot, perfect. Whenever, and then after that, you have me as a as, as a person that that's needed. Like I still have people come up to me at conferences and be like, "Dude, thank you for giving me that. Uh, it's amazing that, that we know each other." I mean, like, I was repping a game, and I met a longtime friend now. Yeah, doing it, like it's amazing. Like you know, and 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 the funniest thing is that when I was doing this, I was still living in in Florida. And I saw a bunch of streamers that I now know personally. Like, you know, I saw you, Viking Blondes. And I'm like, okay, well, he's not playing this type of game, so I'm not going to reach out. But, you know, I knew about him. And then all of a sudden, at PAX, I think it was East. I oh. think the first time we ran into each other was either East or West. It could have been East. I think I did 2016 East. Or 26, 2017 East? 
uh, that would have been last year. So no, not last year's East. Uh, so it would have been last year's West. Okay, so yeah. I mean, I met you at one of the PAXs. And then I'm like, all right, cool, great, whatever. And then I met you again. And then literally at TwitchCon, I saw you. I'm like, get in the booth. Let's have a beer. And then one of my colleagues that worked downstairs was like, you know Will? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I know Viking Blonde. <laughs> And to me, that's just hilarious because then people know this guy. I know him a completely different way. And then all of a sudden, I see him at another party last Saturday. We and did have know, a like, very good time. Yeah, last no, literally, we just we, yeah, no, that was that was that was pretty fun. <laughs> but but no, like, and then when we were at TwitchCon, I found that he lives in Seattle. I live in Seattle as well. Like, geez, yeah. Yeah, um, no, it was it was it was perfect. I loved it. It was amazing. Yeah, um, for me, I, I I don't want to touch on that one because it's actually it's been a lovely little moment for me. Is you telling me that story on Saturday about how was someone asking you if you knew Will? I'm like, no, but I know Viking Blonde. That's the that's the first time someone has known me from this before other things. So that's lovely. Thank you. Um, and jumping back in, um, oh, uh, micro marketing is uh, it's a bit of a catch-all term, but it usually refers to um, small direct interaction style marketing over big campaign and so what Chris was saying about the influencers um, is that it's the difference between paying ninja's cat to stream your game for two hours and it costs 80 million dollars or yeah, reaching out 10,000 probably to, it's sick I've for heard prices cat. about how much he's he asked for an hour and I'm just like that would fund my operation for most of forever um, or you can spend that time reaching out to low tier individuals and interact with them directly. So it's more time intensive. I wouldn't oh. even, I wouldn't even call them low tier. I mean, like, yeah, I, I met a bunch of partners that loved our game at, at, at Twitch, at, loved our game at Twitch cons and all this other type of stuff, but th they, they have a schedule like affiliates you you're either grinding away trying to be like a variety streamer or you're just some or you're just doing something else Where, yeah. whereas like to fit in my my game in a partner schedule it could be like two weeks out and i i mean i don't have time for that i need people to know about it now yeah um i mean for us over here we uh we have a we have a schedule set in place weekly and we keep it pretty rigid but like a couple of weeks ago, we got to have um, uh, the light keeps us safe, and yeah, dude, I I got the um, I got the green light that the build was ready to stream at like two in the morning, and it was like, right, I'll see you in ten hours, where <laughs> nine hours, and yeah, uh, sorry, but bringing it back because uh, I don't want to turn this into a uh, a will flavor discussion. Uh, sorry, Greenfire though is asking, Will, are you secretly a party animal? Oh, there's no secret about it. I'm a monster, and I'm I've chilled out a lot the last few years. But I, there was a reason my profile used to say, "Don't drink with this man." So, um, yeah. so I tell you what, I am going to do. I'm going to reference once again the um, the Dead Cells marketing campaign, which they did a lot of talk about which was the concept that if you reach out directly to individuals, while your initial coverage is lower, the breadth and depth of the amount of places that you cover is larger. And therefore, overall, you can get a better spread. There is a, there is a school of thought that says, while you get more eyeballs and more impressions for paying for a high tier content creator to cover your game. So here we've got 40 people chilling and illing. Um, if you go to someone who has hundreds or thousands, more Good people luck trying to get them to look at you. Exactly. There's competition in terms of even starting the conversation about it. And if they do cover your game, a lot of the time we're seeing that people are going to these content creators for the individual, for the personality. And the game is just a vehicle for that. So the conversion rate, uh, if you don't know the term, conversion rate is every person who sees your game to every person who buys your game. That percentage of sees it, gets it. That's your conversion rate. Uh, is actually much, much lower than if you spent that same amount of time and money, assuming that an individual salary is part of your marketing budget, um, that that time and money on low tier, that you get a higher return on investment. Um, and I think the Dead Cells guys wrote it up real well. 
They also said that by the time they had enough groundswell on the low tier, all the high tiers were like, ooh, what's this game? No one's been talking to me about this. This must be interesting. And, yeah. Uh, sorry, dude, I just wanted to throw that in there because um, I've basically been touting that as community-centric engagement marketing. Um, yeah, but that's, that's, that's what it is. That I mean, for, for the 40 people in this chat, like, that's... You know, if you want to go into marketing or make games, like that's that, that's important. Yeah. You know, like I can I can talk daily about so much things, and you know, it's there's just so much that goes into making games other than freaking game. Yeah. Yeah. You can do the graveyard keeper OST next. <laughs> uh, sorry about this. Uh, me tippy tapping so away good. whilst we're trying to talk. Do it. Do it away do it all that's that's the goal my friend that's the goal um i mean i have a slight advantage because i've been in your position which allows me to know who to talk to and how to do it also i'm you know i have been industry side which means i know a lot of people but it also means that when i say stuff like how you're engaging with individuals like myself how you're bringing your your the titles that you're working on to individuals like me is bloody brilliant and I love it. Like, I can say that with with a full understanding. Uh, anyway, so I want to jump into chat because I see a lot of, of questions. And also, like, if any of you have questions at any point, you just, you hurl them at me. Uh, Dr. P is saying, uh, college advice is random internet places are the best. Uh, they're on a level 2 IT course right now. And I'm not sure if I want to progress onto level 3 game design or level 3 IT. Should they do game design or safe path? I, you just said it. Like, you just answered that question. It depends on what you want to do. Like, yeah, you can get, you can learn game design. Like, sure, go ahead, but you're learning game design. You can, or you can be an amazing, or you can be a great programmer. Like, you want to be a well-rounded programmer. Teaching game design is great because then you learn theory and everything else. But like. At the end of the day, if you have a successful IT job, you can make games on your side and you can still get and be paying. You still can get paid a, a livable wage. Like it's I I'm going to, to spout this being like, listen, I I went from making a hell of a lot of money as a civil engineer to taking a literal half pay cut, more than half, probably 75 percent to work in the place I am. The thing is that I'm happy. For me, it's happiness. It's it's not. I mean, monetary value is is a lot, but you know, in university, you, I would recommend studying IT because I can link books how to teach you design. Yeah. Like, but linking books how to teach proper IT is is a little bit harder. It is a, a qualification that comes with weight. And... Yeah. Having a computer science degree carries more weight than having a game designed it yes um rhymes and moose was adding so maybe it's me but my impression is that larger audiences are necessarily less engaged which seems like it would have a big impact on the value that a content creator brings um i mean i feel like that was the thing we covered but was there anything else you wanted to add onto that one chris i mean no what, having having a guy play your game like pewdiepie that's that's a large thing because you know he's playing it people are looking as a streamer getting someone like ninja to play party hard 2 it's gonna be awesome hell yeah ninja's ninja's playing our game yeah but what about that ongoing column of text that's just like he's fucking he doesn't pause that like yeah he he maybe he maybe has it turned on for people that sub for 25 bucks hypothetically that it like just stacks those messages yeah oh. and then he can read those or he'll he'll look be like haha and like he's not there's no way there's even if you're the best stream in the world that chat is insanity yeah um yeah <laughs> no so greenfire is saying also if you're going to ask someone to cover your game it can be a double-edged sword uh, I don't think I can look at the comic that you're referencing on that, but I mean, while it is true that sometimes sometimes coverage can be negative, I it, nine times out of ten more eyeballs, more eyeballs and more engagement is better because 
I'd rather have one person... I, I'd rather have a room full of people that I have to convince that a game is bad when they think it is good than have a room full of people that don't know the game exists. I'd, I'd rather have that I'll dialogue that. than silence. Yeah, I'll back up on that one. Uh, also, I think uh, Fiona was calling me out on uh, partying. Fiona, we did not party that hard. Uh, so Sorry, Fiona was saying uh, he likes to wander San Jose with a bunch of nerds till 4am. We did not go that hard that night. I, I had to be a party leader and that... Every, yeah, I didn't think that the Saturday around Halloween would be as crazy as it was because I'm a numpty. Um, so we ended up drinking in one of the hotel bars. It was good fun. But yeah, we did not go hard that night. Is there anything else worth throwing in? Okay, the questions of the questions uh, are. Oh no, they're discussing the the points, the back and forth of engagement around a game like Graveyard Keeper. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, Scott is saying they've watched Ninja twice, and it was chat spam fest. Uh, one time it was uh, only one emote for two hours. <laughs> Two hours, single emote. Woo! I mean, that's... That is a thing. That is a thing. It is. Um, it is. But I, I don't want to turn this into a conversation about why, you know, the affiliate to mid-tier is good, because obviously I'm going to feckin' say that. That's how I'm paying my bills right now. You know? Um, I... I would like to move... Back more into the fact that indie publishers have now become less of a quirk, more of a necessity. Um, you know, Devolver, Double Fine, Tiny Builds, Chucklefish, Team Seventeen. These aren't weird little quirky uh, offshoots that you go to if you think your project can't get cash from the big three. Like they are a strong force and a very big part of our industry now. And how do you see that progressing through to 2019? Because, you know, we can make jokes about Red Dead Redemption making everyone else's budget uh, freak the feck out, but 2019's where we're headed. And what can we... What do you feel we should take forward? At this point, it's... If you are an indie... You know trying to get your game out there yeah just just get interactions from publishers get get their feel they will always give you some sort of feedback you know even even it, like you can just label it like just not being like a pitch for publishing just be like i need feedback like a lot of us will get back to you and you know even if like hey you know this is something we're not interested in you can just be like why so so that you can you know act on that and make it a little bit better i mean as well as if you have the budget show your game yeah show your game at conventions it, it's it's a huge thing to get someone out of the industry's uh eyes on it to play it and they will give you like genuine feedback they don't they don't lie sometimes they're like man this game sucks but but why does it suck but random sir oh man the control's weird and you know whenever i move there's like some sort of lag okay thank you have you tried on another controller? Oh yeah, no, it's the same here. It's the same on all of them. Okay. Well maybe maybe it's the maybe it's this. Maybe it's overheating. And you get a genuine feedback. Yeah. Not only are you getting coverage, not only are people becoming aware of you and seeing what it is that you can do, but you're getting honest feedback because guy on convention floor is not gonna hold back on their opinions. I mean I'm, they're not gonna throw a shoe at you, but you know You'd be surprised. Guy on convention floor is kind of a butt. I hate that man. I mean, I didn't want to get into industry bitching, but guy on convention floor. I honestly, I'm I'm amazed he's still in the industry. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I thought he'd be out after the last shoot. Right, feckin' right. But no, still baby. hanging out. He hit that baby. He killed the baby. Yeah, it was. I, I think what was most shocking about it, was it wasn't that he everywhere. wasn't that he killed a baby. It's that it was like a balloon of meat. Like it just popped. Yeah, no. Phil Spencer had chunks of meat across him. Bloated. I don't even know. I 
Yeah. Dude, I felt bad. He was wearing a really nice suit that day too. Yep, and as you well know, chunks of baby do up. not come out. Yeah. He threw up on that girl. Yeah, and that was uh, terrifying. Oh my god. It just chain chain convention, a chain show floor chain so of horrible. like a Rube horrible. Goldberg of Blood, meaty body fluids. Vomit. Yeah. Just Horrendous. Ruined suits, shoes <laughs> everywhere. It was terrible. Go on my show, I said. We'll be, we'll talk about professional things, I said. Yeah. Oh, I'm not even sorry. I'm not even slightly sorry. Those of you that have just joined us, I am chilling and with Chris from Tiny Build, and we are having a bloody marvellous day, if I'm being perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. um, let me just drop the, uh, the Tiny Build link. If you do not know Tiny Build as a publisher, I promise you know their games. I promise. Yep. Um, to Greenfire. Yeah. Uh, what has changed over the past two years in the indie game scene? Tons. Like it's it's not even it's not even like I'm, I I say that, but like it's it's gone from it's gone from like, you know, very you know like cute pixel based like very very high yeah like quality pixel things to just being like you know just an amazing mechanic style game uh mm -hmm. to like i mean if you look at super hot that's a mechanic yeah that's a beautiful mechanic uh like it's it's like three or four colors and that's about it but yeah. then you look at a game like um what's what's another really 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 pretty uh tacoma oh Tacoma's God, gorgeous yes. Yeah, Tacoma's freaking freaking gorgeous. Uh, you look at uh, then you look at games that 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 are you know super replayable and and they're 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 you know they 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 have a huge community which is Stardew Valley. Then yep. you look at games that that actually are talking about personal things and and who you are as an individual, like with um, uh, Undertale. Yeah, because Undertale literally is it's it's just. All it is is how horrible of a person are you? The yeah. Game at a meta narrative level. Uh, we're also yeah. seeing titles like, I, I don't, I'm not saying that it's necessarily a game I want to play, and I think the devs have been an ass every a little bit. But uh, let's take Agony, um, a slightly stealth horror themed romp through literal hell. Um, let's yeah. um, escape from Tarkov, hard hardcore military shooter. Made by a Russian indie team in Unity. That's the thing that I mean, happened. There's, there's, so, there, like the entire scene in itself is. It's changed to the point of what is an independent developer. Yes. Because you know, is, is it a small team? What is a small team like? When, like, we are a indie company. We have twenty people. That's yeah. not that much. The thing is that, you know. Our team that's making Rapture Rejects downstairs is is maybe like eight eight people. Rapture Rejects I mean, is on site? Yeah, Rapture Rejects is downstairs. Could you introduce me to them at some point? Because yeah, I really like the course. look of their game. Uh I'm so tonight oh yeah, I'll message you. <laughs> I mean whatever, you know, I'm chill, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, no. <laughs> um <Heck>. but <laughs> There's there's been so many so many like games that have come out that that are independent titles. Yeah. Like PUBG is an indie game. Yes. PUBG <laughs> was made by uh, initially like a ten or fifteen yeah. person team. Yeah. PUBG is an indie game. Um. Um. Uh, Cuphead, that's an indie game. Oh fucking hell. Uh, Elite Dangerous is an indie game. Like. <laughs> A I... lot of these games, it's it's. I mean, you have your range. You yeah. can you can if you can make it and pitch it, and and get a community around it, you can you can be a successful independent developer. If you can get you know a devolver, you know a tiny build to, to push your title there to you know market it well, and you know for that, but you know that requires you know yeah talk that requires like a really big thing like just because you get picked up by a publisher doesn't mean that you know we're gonna completely take over everything and and, and you know like magic your game's multi-selling millionaire like no it takes time yeah so it and and so that's how it's changed in the last two years that 
marketing is humongous the scope of your products team size uh what you're making what's big right yeah. now everything um it's the it's other, crazy the other thing that we've noticed is that um previously like big launch long tail was a was a viable survivability thing but now we're seeing that you can reach large numbers of sales like ages after launch like obviously you know day one sales are still a huge part but at least in the indie scene there's nothing that stops you from going here and then exploding like way after the fact something that wasn't yeah. obtainable like at least four or five years ago well like, that's what PUBG did yeah PUBG exploded after and you know yeah Fortnite kind of you know Epic came in they made a, a joke thing I would say a joke thing and now yep. it's the biggest game on the planet maybe maybe the biggest game in, in several years I mean I, I, I was in a mall the other day and I see kids kids like beating ass yep in the Microsoft store and I'm like Jesus dude wow uh, they all know this they all know it like you know they know they have dances they, they there were Halloween costumes yeah this from a project which was as I there is no way that I can prove this this is all conjecture and Will's feelings but from a project that was you know the leftovers of so many different devs that was hopped around and that was basically put out the door to either survive or die becoming that like yo what yeah um the other thing that now I'm not saying that anyone else needs to come with me on this on this uh, opinion journey on this uh Will's rant quest but it's one of the things I'm really starting to notice about how the the old guard of the games industry are really falling behind on while, where we are and what we're doing. The the desperation to try and equate the current indie scene to the old methodology of like you know indie AAA first party third party um, terminologies is leading to this confusion. Um, I've heard oh god I've heard so many awful tight uh, names like triple i and double a and all of these terms trying I, to refer to the current scene i like that i i would say that the indie scene has changed drastically to the point where we need a better classing system to denote like what title is what kind of experience yeah. like it, because being an indie game doesn't mean anything anymore it be, I, it does from a business standpoint but it has no bearing on the title and its quality those those times are gone and i also like triple a has reached this bizarre level of like super behemoth you know i keep seeing the trailer for mortal engines and i'm just like it's game what dev. is that uh it's uh based on a I believe it's a book series yeah and it's the idea of cities as kind of these like living moving creatures that hunt each other in um, and I believe this one follows London, one of the biggest and strongest land creatures of all time. And I'm like, it's AAA. It's AAA. Like, yeah. the bigger get bigger and they consume the others. But they become more more vicious and more predatory. And that sustainability is impossible. Um, Chris, I'm going I'm to take this tangent off the rails for a little bit. Um, the previous, uh, previous team that I worked at, they actually did um, split focus. So it was a, I want to say, 30, 40 person dev team across five titles. Staggered launch, small teams, kind of agility. The idea being is that, you know, if all of them sold poorly, you do all right. If one of them sold great, brilliant. If one of them completely tanked, it doesn't bring down all the others. Like, it creates like a fault tolerance development style. Is that five indie projects inside an established studio, or is that... And, and that's... That's where my bugbear with the old guard comes in. I mean, but that's how Free Lives does it. Is that they're always they're always jamming. Yeah. And they're releasing games like that. So those separate teams, they're all I mean, I would say that that studio is an indie studio, but it, I that sounds more like uh what is I mean like oh my god, what is that called? Um Oh my god. I forgot the word. It's literally there. It's Pikachu! It's Pikachu. Damn it! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm bringing the old memes back. It's happening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who's that game dev? It's Pikachu! <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, also, I mean, we've seen with Boss Studios, like, they've built their survivability around Game Jam's quick projects. Um, Weird ones. <laughs> yeah, but that's how they've been rolling. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there's a question from Greenfire. And, by the way, if you have a question for me or Chris before we... Uh, I don't know how much longer we've got your time for, Chris. But if you do, do at Viking Blind in chat so I see it. Because Greenfire would like to ask yeah. us that what we think about games being saved on sites like My Abandoned Wear. Um, Greenfire is a big fan of the Discworld point and click games. I love getting games still on disc. It's, I go, it's, I, I literally start up my car, I go to Best Buy, I pick it off the fucking shelf, and, and I, and I wait for it to install on my Xbox or PlayStation. And, and, and it's, it's something that, that, I mean, everyone's like, literally, I had, I had a, a, a girl, like, over my house, and she points because I moved here and I had all my cases like yeah. just in a corner. She's like, what are those? And I'm like, oh, those are video games. And she's like, why don't you just down download it? And I'm oh, like, no. oh, because I, I like video games. She's like, okay, cool. Two days prior. She's like, do you have any games installed in your Xbox? I'm like, no, they're all disc based. He's like, okay, old man. And I'm like, <laughs> What? <laughs> Back in my day, we played games on disc like they were that proper. Exactly. We installed them uphill both ways, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, I... Yeah. It's... Our, our medium, our industry, and how we're interacting with it is changing so fast. And it's... Yeah. Um, I think what Greenfire was going into was those games that disappear between the cracks. You know, uh, the ones that... There's no publisher, there's no dev. The abandoned wear titles. Well, I mean, with with that, like, I think there there should be a place for for games that, you know, aren't seen and stuff like that. But like, if if it falls through the cracks and you know they're not supporting you anymore, yeah, there should be a place for for it to be and people can play it. And you know, but like, I wouldn't expect people to just make it. At, like oh my god it's the best game ever like if you're not supporting anymore like you're getting what you get true that true yeah. that um <laughs> so yeah and tal was asking chris what was your first game dev job the classic oh question my god what was my first de- i mean this 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 is my first game dev job oh, wait, cool. now if we're now if we're like talking like first game dev job like ever like it was i was a booth representative for berserk studios at twitchcon 2015. berserk studios they made just shapes and beats which finally feckin came out this year only took them forever yeah they are good peoples yeah. and i'm so happy to see them succeed but Will, I'm gonna have to go. No, no, it's entirely fine, Chris. We've had your your lovely company for two hours. Um, yeah. So, um, now you can absolutely say no. Um, if you uh, if there is anything you want to chuck out, uh, keys wise or anything like that, uh, I've got a new key giveaway system, which you Ooh. might want to tune in and see because it's very cool. Um, because uh, failing, I, I mean, I'm gonna roll it. Uh, I'm gonna roll it, whatever, because I desperately need a cup of tea. We have a mosh pit simulator, which we've been using for key giveaways. Um, also, I have not decided entirely what I'm going to roll onto this afternoon. So, if there is, if there is anything tiny build wide that I can uh, that I can uh, sing the praises of, um, uh, I mean, if I'm being honest, I'd love to tear into uh, Outpost Zero if that's okay. But we can always organise that at a later date, or wait until I can pick it up myself. I'm sorry. This is me being an ass. I'm putting it on the spot, and I apologise. Chris, it's been lovely to have you with us today. You can tell yeah. I'm getting overexcited. <laughs> so look, I'd love to have you back sometime in the future. Yeah, if, no, 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 totally. If there are any of your titles that we here at the Longship can support, we want to do that. You know, you know our philosophy here, which is that you know games are art, and if we can support a title, if we can look into it, see the things that are are great about it then 
that's yeah then that's what we'll do yo um rhymes and boost says how are you not already decided to roll into the light keeps us safe um they did do an update they did do an update but chris has been very kind to be our guest and yeah that's that's where i'm rolling this is a little bit more chaotic than usual i know but sorry chris if you leave me to talk i will do this literally all day <laughs> No, I'm 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 doing stuff right there. I sent you a key to Outpost Zero. Oh, dude, thank you kindly, man. <laughs> thank you kindly. So I'll I'll have a tear into Outpost Zero this afternoon, and that'll be real good fun. Thank you. Okay, and let's uh, let's do this real quick. And then these are three keys to Hello Neighbor. Thank you kindly. So we'll do we'll do a few rounds of the mosh pit throughout a few hours, and we'll go from there, yo. All right. Chris. It was amazing talking to you. It was amazing being in this community. I loved all the questions. It was amazing, uh, especially from Green Fire. A lot of the ones that got me thinking. Uh, Scotty, I hope you have a great day. Um, Tar Tarlicus, hope <laughs> you have a great day. Uh, oh my God, what is that? Welcome to my life. Yeah. I love I love them, and their names break me. Hamel. <laughs> Hamill, you have a great day as well. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. You all have a great day. I hope all of you have an amazing weekend. You know. And I got to go and test some things and do a bunch of other, you know, like store assets. And I got to do that. I do. But I love talking. Will, we got to hang out. We got to grab another beer. Saturday. Saturday evening. Yeah. Saturday evening. Saturday okay. evening. Okay. We'll do. What are we doing? On, wait, what is Saturday evening? Uh, Georgetown. G yes. There we go. Invite me on Facebook. T text me on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> Intimately. All right. Yeah. Right. All right. Jokes we'll see aside, you guys. Chris. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Bye. And we go here. And I go here. Okie dokie. Right. Uh, let me just zoom out so you don't have to look at a super close-up version of my face. Um, thank you all for the stonky good questions, and thank you all again, Chris. Uh, thank you all again, Chris. God, I need another cup of tea. Um, yeah. You can all see now why I've been so stoked to introduce you to Chris, because he's been a feckin' legend of a guy, and we've had a feckin' great time hanging out with him, yo. Uh, so... Um, I am going to just quickly boot up Mosh Pit Simulator and input some cheeky stuff. Some cheeky cheeky stuff now. Um, thank you, Chris. Because Chris just gave us a bunch of stuff. So that's real cool. We're going to play Outpost Zero. It's probably going to be a survival game. Um... Oh dear, hang on. Bear with me all just a second. Uh, the uh, Bear with me all just a second, I do apologise. Um, right! Mosh pit and tea. Bloody right you are, Camille. Bloody right. So let me use my mosh pit button. Boop. No, we're not, we're not doing this. We're not doing this, no. All right. Okie dokie. My button's not doing what I wanted to. And it's giveaway time! And I'll put the BLB needs T up. Right. So, if you have not seen this before, this is King of the Pit. And we are going to be using this to give away a key for Hello Neighbor. The premise is simple. We are going to be generating a mosh pit in the middle. Actually, let me... Sorry, Graveyard Keeper. You're lovely, but we just need to not. Um, once this kicks off, if you type exclamation dance, you will be able to enter in a chance to win a thing. Right. Bear with me on just a second. I, I'm clicking so many buttons simultaneously, you all, you all don't even know. Oh, 
And we will do three rounds of this throughout the day. So we're going to be giving away the first Hello Neighbor key in just a second. So uh, let me just finish doing configurations and whatnot. Uh, I'm just, sorry, I'm just tapping away and thanking uh, Chris on the other screen. I do apologize. Do apologize. Uh, Rise of Smooth says, what does top 10 do? Uh, list the top 10 people who have battled it out today. Uh, Camille says, by the way, when's the last time you did hand things? I did my full complement of exercises this morning before I went live. And I've been doing the, the squidgy ball while we've been talking. Probably more than I should have be, but it's been real easy to do. Um... So let me just quickly change it. So registration time for this one, we're actually going to do two minutes because there's a key waiting. Max players, we can have everyone in there. So if you are watching and you would like to be a part of this, you are going to have two minutes to smash. All right. Oh, hang on. We're not quite ready for the BRB Needs T version. So enter yourselves into the pit. The winner of this mosh pit will get a copy of Hello Neighbor. On Steam, so be ready. Who have we got in? We have got all oh, 14 people entered to the ring. Who's ready to dance? Um, now, remember, correct mosh pit etiquette is important. Um, if someone